Whoever. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Forum, so content to, to open the meeting. Just inform everyone just to be mindful of their phones for if they interfere with um, the recording system. And obviously anyone coming into the public gallery will also be, have to be mindful of that. Um, mobile um, devices um, can be used through the Wi-Fi connection, um, but all devices should be muted. Um, passwords are available on the gallery rules for anyone wanting to use the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G um, should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So members, you're very welcome to our, our meeting um, this morning. The committee will consider statutory legislation which is not subject to Assembly procedure and there will also be a departmental briefing um, from the Deputy Secretaries uh, providing an overview um, of the department. Are members aware of any apologies? We haven't received any? None? Okay, thank you. Moving then to Chairperson's Business. Myself and the Deputy Chair met with the Minister for Infrastructure last Tuesday and we also met with the Chief Executive of Translink, Chris Conway, and Translink's Public Affairs and Communications Officer, Graeme Smith, on Wednesday, the 22nd of January. And we will arrange for them to come to brief the committee um, at a future date. At our meeting last week, we agreed to attend the event which is being organised by Translink to announce Northern Ireland's first new sustainable fuel cell buses powered by hydrogen from local onshore wind energy. Now that's obviously taking place tomorrow, so directions um, along with the invitation um, are in um, your pack. Can members indicate at this stage if they plan to attend? Yes, yes. Yes, the house, excellent. Okay, so maybe just um, if we make arrangements then, obviously there's an invitation to go by the by bus at the Europa station, so whether members can maybe indicate to the clerks whether or not they plan to do that or to drive directly, um, just so they, they, we know who to expect at what time. Okay, moving then to the draft minutes, they are at page six of your packs. They're the, for the meeting of the 21st and the 22nd of January. Are members content to agree those? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Moving then to matters arising. Do members have any issues arising from last week's meeting? No? Okay. It's easy enough. Then moving on to our correspondence. We draw your attention to correspondence at page 41 of your pack. Um, this has been received from the Belfast Chamber of Commerce, which is obviously congratulating myself and the Deputy Chairperson on our appointment, and also requesting a, an opportunity to brief <coughs> us on their manifesto. And again, I suppose this stage may be one of these tests as to how we want to handle it. So we can either have an informal open meeting with the entire committee, or we can have um, a meeting with the chairperson, myself and the deputy chairperson to, and the clerks to meet. So we really can be led by the committee in this, if you want to suggest. I'm quite content if you want us, myself and the deputy just to meet at this stage, if there's anything additional. Chair, I would think so. Okay, thank you. <coughs> content? Okay. Moving then to our table papers, um, at page six, we have ministerial correspondence providing an update on MOT centres. Um, page eight, we have the press release from the Department of Infrastructure providing an update on the MOT centres. And then we have page nine, a ministerial statement regarding the MOT temporary exemption certificates. So obviously everything has, has moved on quite considerably over the last 24 hours. Um, obviously we'll be receiving a, a briefing this morning from um, officials, although we do plan to have uh, Paul Duffy from DVA um, come to the committee next week. Um, so there's an opportunity then to, to brief him at that stage as well. Mr sure. Boylan. Yeah. Chair, when, when is our intention to bring the minister to the committee? The minister's coming next week as well. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mr Beggs. 
I, I view this as a matter of urgency, and I don't think we should be even waiting a week and thinking that's comfortable with the, the Minister in a week. Um, many uh, cars will no longer be legal to be on the road, particularly I'm thinking of those cars that are coming for their MOT at the first ta- for their first time. Uh, that will affect taxi drivers, that will be affecting people trying to get to their work, looking their school run. So this is a major issue, and the, the pressures which were already on the MOT system are going to be magnified. I appreciate the Minister's taking some decisions, but this is, I would say, very, very important that we address it. And uh, I, I, I'm not satisfied to date what has happened, uh, and I think we need to do something urgently. There's been suggestions of seeking an emergency extension to the need for MOTs for a further year. I think that's an excellent idea. Those will be new cars, relatively good condition, and that would ease pressure on the systems to allow others to make use of the capacity that does exist. Uh, I don't think we should be waiting a week and then acting. We as a committee need to encourage movement now, and we should be seeking an urgent meeting with the Minister um, to ensure that this issue is progressed. Well, you'll, you'll know that we have officials coming up here this morning. So if you are content that we we question them and then at the end of the session, then we perhaps then take stock of what we've heard. Obviously, this is a fluid situation and obviously we're looking for answers. I, I tabled an urgent question for you yesterday and obviously a written statement came um, and things have moved on since then. So there had been a request for her to come to the, to the, to the Assembly to, to brief members. But as you know, things moved on last night. If we have the opportunity to speak to officials now and then at the end of the meeting decide our next steps. I'll take that further on the meeting, we'll take a decision on it. That's fine, Mr. Yeah. Boylan. I, I agree with that approach, Chair. We would obviously Mr. Beggs wasn't in at that point because a number of table questions from last Thursday night from this is broken and there are priority questions. You know, it's live and it's fluid the whole time and it seems to be getting worse and worse the more you listen <coughs> to towards it. I appreciate we have an opportunity now, there's somebody from DVA. Let's see what DBA has to say, but certainly, as soon as possible, obviously the Minister will have to come before us and answer. We'll take on board what's been said today, and then we'll move from there. Okay. okay. I'm happy enough for that process. Mr. McCartney. Is she having the suggestion that Royal Mix is a good one, the, the year's extension, but could we find out from the officials as quickly yeah. as possible? Is that possible? Is that legislatively possible? Yeah. 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 Okay. Members, members content with that. Okay. We move then to item six. There are 194 statutory rules which are not subject um, to assembly proceedings. A list of the statutory rules are at page 53, and the rules are included in the pack at pages 63 to 1187. I just ask you if you're content to note those statutory rules, unless, of course, you have any issues in relation to any specific proposal. Mr. Beggs. One very that I find very surprising was that um, on page 62 it indicates that uh, the, uh, it was agreed by the committee in October 2010, and it could have been the first draft completion of the draft guidance was 2013, but the Minister for Region Development then decided not to commence. Why is this sat for so long? Page 62. Oh, yes, well, then. <coughs> you know, I think that we, I would like to question the officials why it sat for so long. In 2013, without uh, being enacted, and it's now been brought to us now. It might be something that we may need to just. We may just need to. We appreciate ask. we cannot t- uh, uh, change uh, no, how this happened, but I think we, can ask the we need to scrutinise what is, what's been going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe ask, is that your party colleague at that stage, was it? Okay. Chair. Mr. Muir. Thank you. Just a similar issue. Um, I'm aware of the context behind this legislation, which is um, 6.1, page 62, um, and there was an opportunity to commence it earlier, and then the, the previous infrastructure minister decided to commence it. But the commencement of this legislation has caused significant issues, and in the absence of 
the Minister for the last three years, but there's been no opportunity to uh, address the issues arising from that. And perhaps the reason why there was a delay in terms of commencing it was the concerns in relation to what the impact would have been. And I think it would be interesting to understand from officials, really, is there going to be you know, a briefing delay in terms of whether there's going to be a review of this legislation and the impact it's had? Because I know, it, you know there's lots of stuff here which is all... You know, relatively minor subordinate legislation, but this year has had a real impact upon communities. Um, you know, and people are organising uh, road races or other charity events and stuff like that. They've been cancelled, or the costs associated with those have been went up quite substantially. So it's a piece of legislation that probably does need reviewed and understanding from officials, really, in terms of what the way forward is in relation to this. Because for the last three years, we've been told nothing could be done without a minister, but. It would be good to see if we could do something in relation to it. Okay, Mr. Hilditch. It, this was uh, spoken about in other committees as well, and I think at that time the minister was under a, sefe a severe lobby from the people that Andrea has just spoken about in relation to not, to not implement it potentially. Okay, Mr. Beggs. Yeah, that, but as, as has been said, um, it's what can be done if it does need adjusted. Uh, and we're being told now this has been. You know, we're just being, it's being noted, uh, so it is affecting. Uh, so with, uh, I agree with what others have said, is there a need for review? And we shouldn't just simply be, be okay, well, here today, we need to uh, study it further. Okay, well, if members are content, we can ask officials to come to brief us on this yeah, particular issue. We can try and do that for, schedule that for next week as well, if you're content to do that. Okay. Any other queries or issues? All content? Okay, so members are content to start to note the statutory rules. Thank you. Moving then on to the departmental briefing and for members um, information, Hans Sark will be reporting this meeting. And again, just please ensure that your mobile phones are um, switched to um, Wi Fi only and onto airplane mode and not on um, three or four G. And any devices that you have also ensure that they have been muted. So can I welcome um, Mr John McGrath, Deputy Secretary of Transport and Resources from the Department for Infrastructure, Dr Andrew Murray, Deputy Secretary of Roads and Rivers, Department for Infrastructure, and Ms Julie Thompson, Deputy Secretary of Planning, Water and DBA at the um, Department for Infrastructure. Oh, you're, three of you are very welcome to our meeting this morning. Um, just from the outset, can I say that I am slightly disappointed the fact that the papers were so late um, yesterday. Um, it has meant that members haven't really had a proper chance to probably um, spend the time that they would like to have done so on those. I know the request went in on the 16th of January for the papers. Um, it is regretful that they were so late. Well, sure. Um, obviously, we're sorry the papers got late. I wasn't too sure I recognised the 16th of the request, but obviously, um, uh, we would like to uh, give the committee the best service we can going forward, so whatever learning points are available from that, we'll pick them up. Okay, we very much appreciate that. Um, obviously, um, you're here to um, discuss broadly the, what the department does, and, and members will come to those questions uh, in due course. There is a, a critical issue in relation to the MOT situation, and it would be remiss of the committee not to spend a little bit of time before we go into general questions, just to, in relation to that. I suppose, really, at, at lunchtime yesterday, we had a statement from the minister, which was giving the impression that the situation was obviously in hand. Um, by early evening, we had Paul Duffy then cancelling all the MOT, so it escalated quite quite quickly um, during the course of the day. Uh, this morning, he's saying that this could take weeks, if not months, to resolve the situation. You may then have to replace all the lifts at, a, at a, obviously a quite, a, quite a cost to, I'm imagining, the, the public purse, although perhaps you might want to give clarification in relation to that, particularly in a time when we are under quite severe budget constraints. Um, and it's, a, it's something, obviously, which is unforeseen too. Um, that said, can you maybe give us some more information about how we find ourselves in what has turned out to be quite a symbolic situation and where we move on from here? 
Yes, happy to do that, uh, Chair. Um, maybe that's the place to start in terms of the, the lead into this, and just to, to be clear how this has happened. Uh, and obviously, then, yes, picking up the very recent developments of yesterday evening, and I'm happy to also talk about those. <coughs> Um, this is not a situation, obviously, anybody wants to, to find themselves in at all. And we're particularly concerned about the disruption uh, for our customers and what it means for them. And I'll touch on that as well. In terms of um, the, the general issues, um, all the lifts within DBA are inspected and monitored on an ongoing basis. Minor inspections every eight weeks and major inspections every six months on the lifts within our uh, centres. So going back into last year, uh, the six monthly inspections were started um, in July, and those were running through and went through till November. By that stage, nine MOT centres had had clean bills of health and no cracks had been lodged by the, or, uh, by the supplier um, on those lifts. The 10th centre, which was Lauren Test Centre, the supplier identified cracks, and that was in November. But had no concerns about the safety of the lift um, and set off to then test the, uh, and go through the continue doing those inspections through the remaining five centres. That work continued uh, through to January um, and on the 15th of January it was at that point that we got the report that said that there were signs of cracking to varying degrees and those cracks are at varying degrees. Some of them are, are particularly wide and others are, 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 are much more narrower. So cracks to varying degrees on 48 of the 55 lifts that are in operation. Again, however, no safety concerns being logged at that point. DBA then asked for a full uh, inspection uh, to be carried out of all the lifts, going back over the ones that have been given, if you like, the clean bill of health earlier in the process. And following that, um, and further inspections of lifts on the 22nd of January, uh, that was when, effectively, that we took the precautionary <coughs> step to take the lifts down until they had been inspected, repaired and re-inspected. Now, all the way through this, each of those lifts, we've been working with suppliers, we've been in cl clarifying with them what the position is on each lift um, and ensuring that, that the safety of the customers and of the staff was given priority. So that was the process and that was where we were. You know that Minister then was obviously very concerned about that and acted very quickly. Um, and as of uh, Friday and then coming into the weekend, we put in place the temporary exemption certificates, uh, which effectively was giving four months extra on an MOT certificate to all cars and light vehicles apart from those who are four years old. Um, because there's no MOT certificate to actually extend for those and taxis because they operate under different legislation. And we were also taking steps to prioritise those. And that was the position as where we were uh, coming into yesterday morning and into the afternoon. Yesterday afternoon then, uh, through a meeting with the supplier, uh, they were not able to give us sufficient assurances about the effectiveness of the repairs that have been put into place. And on hearing that, um, the DBA had obviously no option and uh, absolutely took the right step to suspend the testing under those lifts um, until the issue is resolved. Uh, testing on heavy goods vehicles and on buses obviously continues for now. Um, the, we are also trying to prioritise and obviously very concerned about taxis and buses, sorry, taxis and four year old cars. Um, and we're seeking to put those through. What's happening within each MOT centre, there is still a heavy duty lane that is working. It does not use the lifts. It is not affected by this at all. Um, and we're seeking to put taxis and four-year-old cars through that uh, alongside the heavy duty um, vehicles that need to go through there too. Um, obviously then communications to customers and to staff has been a, a key priority as well and we have been and that's why there have been several engagements and, uh, and lots of media and, and statements being made on this <coughs> through uh, from the, the middle of last week through to yesterday. We will continue to update people today. We appreciate certainly in, in last week's situation each thing was each lift was being looked at. It was a very fluid situation and that led to uh, some customers turning up when actually the MOT ended up then being cancelled. Um, so um, that fluidity, I guess, is not so much of an issue now, because what we're saying is don't turn up uh, for your appointment. Uh, we will contact directly uh, customers with taxis and four-year-old cars to bring them in. So it's a much clearer message, I think, for the public, because it is less fluid now in terms of where we're at. 
we're obviously then looking at the <coughs> position about well how do we move this forward then and, and fix it and get it resolved um, as far as that is concerned um, <coughs> what we're doing is looking to see what the status of each of those lifts are um, we will then be looking about uh, uh, is the answer to this about replacing parts about replacing whole lifts and how do we deal with that um, and that's been done as a matter of urgency um, the issue around that, and that's a whole lot of work, I guess, that needs to, to be looked for uh, in that. Um, and we are, you know, those options just basically need to be worked through to, to, to determine both what we need to do and in what time frame. But it's, it's been given, obviously, full urgency. The minister has called urgent meetings and has uh, um, obviously put the, the notes around executive colleagues to yourselves. Uh, did the ministerial statement, which was factually correct at the point in time we were at yesterday, um, and obviously position then moved on considerably yesterday evening. She called a meeting yesterday evening, and she's calling another one today. So um, we are moving very quickly to uh, the issue, and we obviously fully apologise to all the customers um, that have been affected by it. And we are trying to prioritise the right vehicles so that the ones that have the problems are, are um, uh, as in that they can't get the extensions, are the ones that are given priority within the centres. In terms of standing back from it and saying, well, how did we get here? Um, and, you know, um, how did this arise? When you're in a position whereby this has never happened before, uh, the cracks <coughs> have not been identified. Um, this is very, very fluid, very recent. Um, and therefore, we're in a position now where we're dealing with that position. We are obviously talking to the supplier, to the inspectors, to the repairs people. All of that is, is all in train, um, and it's it, you know that is a, a situation that moves almost on, on a daily basis. So there are many trains that we are 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 making sure that we have in hand here, from um, communications to supplier management. To talking to uh, our staff and ensuring, and, but the priority and the real the reason for all of this is the health and safety of our staff and customers. There was no choice in the action. That's why um, the the step was taken last night, um, and we have to respond to that health and safety first and foremost. Unfortunately, that is leading to disruption, and it's leading to obviously then the work that we need to do in order to get this rectified and get it rectified very urgently. Okay, and I absolutely agree in relation to the issue around health and safety, and it's much better that we're in this situation having this discussion now than had something very serious happened and that we were looking backwards rather than um, trying to, to put in place measures um, which would enhance safety. Can I just ask how old the lifts actually are? <clears throat> The majority lifts are from 2011-2012, so what's that, um, eight, nine years old. And are inspections carried in-house or are they carried out externally? Um, is it manufacturer linked? Can you maybe explain so that So it's a contract with the manufacturer um, and then there's a subcontract contract on the uh, inspecting and on the repairs regime. Those are both subcontracted out. Um, we are obviously looking at one of the options about getting an, in, uh, an independent assessment again on the lifts um, and doing that through a separate route and that is likely to be one of the angles that we, are, we will put in place very quickly. And is it considered that the, in, in the first instance that the lifts were actually fit for the purpose in which they've been used? Given that we have got no, no sign of anything and no concerns, safety concerns <coughs> being raised by those suppliers, uh, then you know this has literally come out of the blue from a, a, a record that doesn't show any cracks within the system and certainly has not logged those as being immediate safety concerns. So the start of this and the first cracks that are logged as, um, are from November, uh, but even at that there was no concerns raised at that point. And it's then the trail that goes through to uh, the 15th of January, whereby we um, learn more about the extent of those cracks, where DBA asked for, understandably, asked for more inspections to be carried out. <coughs> and in, in all of that then leads to the 22nd of January around um, the, the first kind of uh, step in, and then the step in of last night. Well, there has been an increase in the usage of the lifts over the last number of years with the number of vehicles, increased number of vehicles on the road. And obviously you have admitted that there is a capacity issue anyway 
with regard to MOT centres. So I'm sort of mindful of that, that you're putting additional pressure onto, onto lifts on a daily basis that perhaps weren't, wasn't anticipated at the time of installation and really then goes back to asking the question whether they're now fit for purpose for what we need now. Yeah, and I guess that, that issue, and if we, if we look to what we need in the future, we will obviously be taking those demand issues in, into account. Um, but you know, the, the regime of having those checks in place, the eight weekly, the six monthly, in terms of making sure they were checked, we had put in place and what, we, what they had been working through up until yesterday was a, a, a programme of uh, inspecting, repairing, re-inspecting, and we'd also put in a two-week re-inspection as well to confirm that things were okay, you know, were, were still operating okay. Um, that, based on what we knew at the time, was um, was you know what we needed to do, um, and it has really only come out in in the very recent, you know, certainly last night in terms of the change of last night, and then in the last few days uh, prior to that, that you know things needed to be looked at more clearly. We will we will need to step back uh, on lots and lots of this. The ministers asked for a review um, of how did we get here. The contingency planning, our communications to the public. Um, she obviously had asked for the temporary exemption certificates to be put in place. Uh, there's a step back needed about how we procure, what we procure. All of that will need to be looked at. How we set up our maintenance contracts. We will have to have discussions with the supplier about the current situation um, and what, if anything, we can do via them with that in a contractual manner. And that that was also another part of, of what we need to do. So there's lots of angles on this. Priority health and safety first and foremost. Secondly, get the communications out to the public. Thirdly, make sure that the public know and that we are giving them the protection that they need through the temporary exemption certificates and then working with the taxis and the four-year-old cars. And fourthly, working then with the getting understanding on the lift side of things and where we go. That's been the order of where we have been at. Um, in very, very short time in terms of how this has all uh, transpired. And there have been discussions on, in the broader media in relation to dealing with the capacity and perhaps whether or not you need to look at a different method of testing or, in fact, look at the, the year in which a car should then start to be tested, given, obviously, the improvement in, in motor vehicles over the last number of years. Yes, and I think those are all. You know, those are broader questions, aren't they? And probably not one for certainly not one for me for today. Um, you know, in terms of you know, we need to make sure that absolutely what we're providing is a is a fit for purpose service. Today it is not, um, and therefore we need to take steps to make that a more effective service in the future. Okay, quite a number of members have indicated, um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks very much for for some of the answers. Um, I do agree with you. You, customer, I know people who've never been to MOT Centre. I mean, customer safety is an issue, mm -hmm. and, and whether or not there was a collapse of lift, uh, according to some reports. I mean, you don't sit that far away from it if you're in a test centre, especially our mile one. I know, I know for experience. So, worker and customer system, uh, safety is a major issue. But I just want to go back to the procurement because it's going to be a major part to play in the future. I mean, all of a sudden, all, like I take it, all of these lifts didn't go at the same time. Or did they all go into um, Not all of them, but a significant number of them did. Right, I, because it mean, was mean all of a sudden now they've all failed. I mean, and I agree the chair said that the increase in the number of vehicles being tested would certainly lead that. But, <coughs> but I do welcome the point that you mentioned procurement because there's there's certain questions asked, and and the issue for us is then, in part of the procurement process and the contracts, uh, there needs to be checks and balances as to how that's all carried out. Because I mean, it seems to me. Come November, bang, and everything's happened, and it's all out over the media. We're we're getting the stories through press, and appreciate the minister has tried to respond to some of the questions that we brought up. Um, yeah, the procurement staff, the, and, and I would I want the, the you know to take on board those comments. <coughs> the other issues you mentioned there about now you're going to put the other cars through one of the lanes. Mm -hmm. What equipment's on those on those lanes on the lorry lanes? On the lorry lanes, there's not a lift involved. There's effectively a pit, so it's it's right. driven over the top of the pit, so there, the, there's no lift involved in it, and, and therefore it's a completely different system to, as you as you say, from a okay. MOT where the car goes oh, yeah. up into the air. And, and the point is, but I take it then, how then do you do the exact same checks? So there's rollers, obviously, for, for breaking those, but in terms of the hydraulic lift on the lift itself, the chest, the joints and all of that, I'm just... I'm getting technical here, but I know it. I mean, you know, there's enough 
I'm hearing from constituents now, there's loads of people out there who have booked tests. <coughs> You're saying you want to put them all through one lane. That's going to take a considerable period of time. We would always have, this is nothing new, that you put cars onto the heavy duty lane. Obviously, the priority and the normality would have been that buses and heavy uh, goods vehicles go onto those lanes. However, cars have been routinely um, tested on those heavy, heavy uh, duty lanes. And to the Chair's point, given the capacity issues and the volume and the demands, we've been using those lanes flexibly to enable cars to be looked at. So that's normal practice, and, and the, the centres are well geared to testing cars, and they can obviously test them on those lanes. Um, so, so there's no change in the test itself? Like the test know. itself will be the same test um, and therefore and it will operate, there will be many people who will have had their cars tested already uh, in routine procedure <coughs> on those heavy duty lanes. In, in terms of the certificate, I mean there's a lot of questions being asked now whether the cars are roadworthy, whether they need to be taxed, the issue of insurance. Uh, can you explain how we're going to get through all of that? or? explain how we're going to go to the public and communicate that message and whether they're legally uh, qualified to drive on the road or not, whether the road car is roadworthy. Okay, there's there's several layers to that. Um, all owners, are, it is their responsibility to ensure that your car is roadworthy at all times. Um, we all know an MOT is done at a point in time um, and then something can break down, a light might break or something <coughs> like that. It's, it's all of our responsibilities to ensure our cars are roadworthy on an ongoing basis. The MOT certificate is then given out on an annual basis in support of that. Um, the temporary exemption certificates that we have put in place and which have been either backdated from, from Monday the 20th of January if they needed to be or are being put in on a daily basis as MOTs, existing MOTs expire. So they are able to pick up from our systems when an MOT is expiring. You need to have booked your car in for a test and have that <coughs> test cancelled by the DBA for us to pick it up uh, from our system. So we know that you've booked in a, a, an appointment that, you, that, that we, as in DBA, have cancelled that appointment. We will pick that up in the system within the offices and go into the back office system, if you like, and give that extension, that four-month extension, in the back office system. That is legal from the minute that it changes on our back office systems. Uh, a customer may, may not get their actual letter confirming that, because that's obviously an administrative process that has to go through for maybe a week or ten days. But as soon as those processes are done in the MOT centre, that will be legally changed. There is then an automatic overnight on that into the DVLA systems where the tax is picked up. So they can automatically see that your tax has, uh, sorry, your MOT certificate is now at a different date, four months hence, and therefore the tax is, is able to operate off the back of that extended temporary exemption certificate. And if those are in place, then that should allow an insurance provider to equally confirm that you're legally insured to drive. Now, there's a lot of steps in that, and I appreciate that. Um, and people may wish to contact their insurance provider and confirm that they are comfortable and, and what, with all of that. But our understanding is that as the very act of putting that temporary exemption certificate in place is extending that MOT to a different date. All the systems that talk to each other in the background, including the tax one, know that that has been put in at the extra four month date. Um, and the insurance, therefore, should be legal pr provided. Presumably, <coughs> if you need your insurance and other things like that, that are your own responsibility. So, all of that, if you like, for those vehicles, bar the taxis and four-year-old cars, we have used this system before. It's some years now since we did it, but we have done it before. Um, and therefore, those are the checks and balances that are applying in, in the background for it. I appreciate that that is quite complicated for everybody to understand. And um, there is a lot for people to digest in this, and we, we, we recognise that, that communication is one of the one of the issues around this. Ensuring, obviously, that media, NI Direct, uh, social media, all of these things are picking up the right messages. Um, um, and insurance providers may be asking questions, and it's understandable maybe that they do. Um, um, but our our understanding is. It uh, will definitely resolve the tax issue automatically, system by system. The customer does not need to do anything as long as they have actually booked an appointment with the DVA and had that appointment cancelled, then the system will pick it up. If you don't make an appointment in the first place, <coughs> then blatantly uh, nothing will. So we are still encouraging, and we still encourage today 
people to uh, book their appointments. So when those reminder letters are going out to people, they should still be booking appointments um, because only through the cancellation of those appointments are we then picking them up and, and fixing them in the system at the time when their MOT expires. But somebody tell you to book an appointment last night and couldn't get on the system, wouldn't accept it. Is it? Can you book an appointment online? My understanding is yes, but I can definitely get that clarified. Uh, yeah. and ju just uh, one quick point, Chair, I know everybody answers questions. Now. The uh, issue, it's, it's reported now it's going to take a certain amount of money to fix all of this. Um, have you any indication of what that is? And I, I asked the question in the context of yesterday, there was a monitoring round in the Chamber. We have known now for a number of days, we may not have known the amount, but now we're going to, because it will come back to this committee to support a, a bid to get some monies to, to replace <coughs> all of these. Um, was there any discussions in relation to that? The, uh, in terms of, the, the, of the financing of it, obviously you're absolutely right, it's very, very early, early doors in terms of uh, up until last night the lifts were being repaired and fixed and whatever and, and the purchasing them urgently was not uh, part of the um, where we thought we were. In terms of um, how it would be funded, um, DBA has like a trading fund where it operates as an agency, so it's part of the department, they are departmental staff, but it operates as a, as a trading fund, uh, and therefore the first place that any funds and any costs of this sort of nature come from is from that DBA trading, trading fund. Now it's still public funds and still needs to be absolutely uh, looked after and used appropriately. But it would not be a call on, um, nor would we be bidding for it into the in-year monitoring process. It's a matter that DBA can resolve and have the reserves to resolve. Um, but it's still obviously a significant amount of money uh, and something that we need to make sure we're, we're spending appropriately and wisely. Just on that point, can I, are you aware of what reserves DBA have at this mm. stage? Um, I. Mm, I think I am, but I, I'm kind of reluctant to give a number. Uh, but it's certainly well sufficient to deal with to deal with this. Yeah, that might be something maybe we'd speak to Paul Duffy whenever he comes yes, to the committee then next week. Okay, thank you. George, just a, on just a quick wee mention. Certainly, in the issue of procurement contract, is a vitally important one for us. Mm -hmm. and that needs to be open and transparent, and the, the checks and balances need to be put in place to make sure. That doesn't happen again, but I have loads of questions, but I'll let all our members do. Okay, um, thank you. Mr. Buchanan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Thompson, just a question. I'm going to pick up on the whole maintenance regime. It's a bit of a former background of mine. So, you see, in the eight week check, obviously that's every eight, week, eight, eight weeks. Yes. Is that by uh, an outsourced company? Yes, the supplier um, outsourced uh, subcontracts. The uh, inspector and the uh, and also the repairing function. <coughs> so, from is the your is your contract with the supplier who then our, sub? Absolutely, our contract with the supplier who then subcontracts. Right, so the contract, okay. And is that one subcontractor across Northern Ireland? Uh, no, um, yes, one co uh, one subcontract across Northern Ireland for the inspection, as I understand it, and one subcontract for the repairs. <laughs> Okay, so the subcontractor does the eight-week check? Yes. Okay. The six-month check, who does that? The same subcontractor, as I understand it. Right. Do you see from a, a Lawler lifting regulation point of view, do you get in, you, you, in my previous life, you do your own maintenance regime, or you, 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 you farm it out as such, but you also get your insurance company then inspect the equipment to, to clarify them who are insuring you. Now, I'm not sure what way it works for yourselves, but certainly in the private itself is the case. So does any insurance company inspect that, or is it only the one supplier does all the inspection, or a subcontractor inspection? The subcontracting <coughs> inspecting uh, inspector is through an insurance company. So that's an insurance company that is doing that inspecting, okay. reporting to the supplier, who then reports okay. to us. So it's an insurance inspector every yes. eight weeks? Okay. Yeah. So was these... Issues picked up on the six months check, which is obviously more more of an inspection regime than an eight week check, because an eight week would be a general <coughs> check. So were they picked up on the six month check or the eight week check? The original uh, issue from November is a six month check, and there was a series of six month checks going on through all the MOT centres at that point. And is that a, a, a is that a, an hour check? Is that a day check? What, what's the period of time roughly in that six month check? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I wouldn't know the, the, the length. But obviously it's more in-depth. It's more in-depth, in okay. absolutely. You see the fault that's picked up then? Was that a, <coughs> you're talking about the crack, 
Is that a stress crack, a fracture crack? Do you know the detail of that, what that is? I know its cracks are very, it's in the scissor arms of the, of the lift. Okay. Uh, I know the cracks have varied certainly in their size. Uh, in terms of the, the exact kind of technical uh, explanation of that crack, I wouldn't be the, the person to be able to answer that. So, so the manufacturer, is that a UK manufacturer or a European manufacturer or where they manufactured the lifts? Um, they're Irish based and they're a leading supplier of lifts. So had they any other faults across, I presume they're a world supplier, are they? Uh, yes, they're a world supplier. So is this the first faults they have picked up in Northern Ireland? We are not aware of, of anything of this nature and certainly not in our, on our record. We are absolutely still in very early doors conversations with the supplier. And this gets into that sort of territory in terms of what has happened here. Uh, the quality of what they have been doing, uh, how they have been getting their assurances, what does that mean about lifts in general. Um, so a lot of those conversations are still in the happening um, and therefore I, you know, they, they need to be followed through. We will follow them through with the supplier. So Absolutely. as of today, is there a solution apart from replacing a lift? Is there a, a part that can be replaced? We are having conversations, there are several conversations that are going in terms of options. Uh, we are looking at parts, we are looking at lifts and we are looking about a second opinion on the uh, inspector to see whether another opinion would bring the same issues in terms of safety and whether those are brought through from a set for them secondary is, is level. It a, I know it is very early but is there a timeline of all that, Julie, in regard to getting parts? You know, because if this was identified in November, that supplier could say, well, it's that part, it's that fracture, we can replace it or we can't. We're now at a bit of a pack in February. Yeah, and, and when, when I say November, that was when the first sign of the cracks were reported. It's only in January, uh, 15th of January, that it becomes 48 lifts out of uh, the 55. Uh, and then only last uh, Wednesday, uh, 22nd of January, where it becomes a more serious issue. Up until that point, <coughs> Um, we have um, a very isolated, or what looks like an isolated in incident in November, uh, then becoming a more widespread incident. We think we have put in place an inspection, repair, reinspection regime. Two weeks extra inspections going on in place, and it's only then last night where the assurances are not able to be given to us by the supplier that led to the decisions of last night. It is a really fluid position. <coughs> One, I would suggest that everybody is struggling to understand how does this happen out of the blue. Uh, and we need to follow the trail with the supplier about all of that, with the inspector as well, and the repairs. Um, and then leading from that about our options about what do we do next in terms of procurement and whatever. So uh, whilst priority has absolutely been given, and rightly so, to um, health and safety and also to customer impact, we are also working with the supplier um, to understand what is going on. And that's part of our Minister's review is how did this happen um, and what is the learning and how do we avoid this happening again. Okay, uh, just on the mention the number of lifts, did you say 55 in total? 55 in total. And how many uh, faults identified with? Um, in, on, on the 15th of January, there was 48 uh, identified. Uh, we had 21 up and running yesterday. Um, um, and obviously, as of today, none. So, can, are you not at a position to use the seven that there's no issues with? Or are you just. We have decided, uh, as a precautionary measure, that we should take them all down. We may come to a view that actually some on this re if we can get a second opinion, a reinspection or whatever, we may be able to bring some of them up. But we took the decision last night that it was safer and better to take them all down. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair, and I don't envy your position. Uh, Certainly, there's a, a lot of work in relation to confidence and trust with the public at this stage, and difficulties with communications as well. I know this morning we've sort of covered tax insurance, but the enforcement as well as to how that's all going to play out uh, to those affected. Uh, could you tell us, Julia, if there's a was there a case that there were some welding repairs carried out? Would that be accurate to say that as well at some stage? Uh, yes, the repairs were we are welding repairs. That's um, as the cracks cracks were identified. The welding was going in to to fix the repair. Um, so yes, that is a that is true. Um, was it working? No. Uh, but they were then being reinspected before they were being brought back into. Uh, so as of even last 
you know, during the tail end of last week, welding was going on, <coughs> lifts were being reinspected and they were being brought into use. As of last night, the supplier wasn't able to give us sufficient assurance about the quality of those repairs and hence the decision. But welding is absolutely part of, uh, of, of fixing it. Okay, and uh, Mr Boylan touched upon the, uh, the danger to the public in some of these centres, but I would like to touch upon the issue of the employees affected. Uh, how he is working with the employees, who I'm sure their confidence and trust at this stage is very low, having potentially had to work in that scenario. Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. Um, so working with employees, obviously it has been a very, very fluid position, so making sure that everybody's up to date. Um, we know at times that has been a, a, a difficulty and a challenge to us. Um, having said that, uh, we have been operating through those test centre managers and our deputy test centre managers if they're, if they're there. A lot of it has to be done verbally because you know they're, they're not sitting at computers and, and looking at, uh, they're, they're in test centres. So a lot of the communications are verbal communications. We've obviously been working with trade union side uh, and keeping them very much in the loop in terms of what this looks like, as they would be anyway on the health, health and safety regime generally across DBA, but certainly in the last few days. Um, they are the ones um, both in terms of being under the lifts, but also in terms of dealing with the, uh, the angry customers who are coming up and who uh, are not happy that their, their appointment is not being scheduled. So we absolutely uh, need to ensure we're communicating. I am, uh, you know, we will continue to take steps to do that. I'm sure we will need to do more in that space. Um, in order to ensure we get the messages out, um, and staff at times, I'm sure, are not fully aware of what actually has been happening. That may be because of the, and is likely to be because of the pace at which some of this has actually moved. But we are doing our utmost um, to ensure that staff are kept apprised as the as the position moves. But it's moving; it has moved so fast that um, at times that is obviously a challenge to us. But you're absolutely right there, safety and that of the public around the lifts is absolute priority. And it's, it's led to us taking the precautionary step, including taking out some lifts and taking them down, even though we're not, there's nothing actually wrong with them as we understand it at this point. We're just taking it uh, away that way. And is it accurate then that staff were actually in danger? No, in that, you know, where, where lifts were being brought back in, they had been given uh, by those inspectors, re-inspected and told that they could come back into operation. So we were only bringing them back into operation. That's why there was only 21 lifts operating yesterday, because only 21 of them had that, um, had that bill of health. As of last night, then, the supplier confirmed that they couldn't give sufficient insurances based on the further work that they had done. And that led us to say, well, if you can't, then the whole lot's coming down. So, but every lift had been given that we reopened, <coughs> had been given, or had been re-inspected, and we were told was okay to open. Now, that's obviously something that we are very concerned about. Um, and we will follow up with the supplier and the inspector. It's another avenue of, of questioning that we will need to be doing with them. Okay, I think there's more to develop on that, but not with yourself today, obviously. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> uh, okay, thanks, thanks for the update. Just can you clarify from what you've said? My understanding is someone who had applied for an MOT and has been rejected, they can go on to DVA in Swansea and get taxed if, they're, uh, if they've got this four-month extension. Is that operational now? So um, they actually don't need to do anything. Um, if, you, if you have a, a, an appointment with DVA and the DVA cancel that appointment, okay, and then the day that your MOT, so we're doing it obviously on a, on a day by day basis, um, on the day that that MOT is due to expire, the staff in the centres, and we had them all working over the weekend to keep this moving to ensure we were operational in this, um, the staff in the centres are then processing the system, our system, DBA system, to issue the temporary exemption certificate to give that four month extension to all the cars and light vehicles apart from taxis and four year old cars. Our systems back up automatically overnight into the DBLA system, which is the tax system. And they will automatically pick up in DVLA that that MOT date that used to say January is now saying April or May or whatever the date may be. 
So, so that's happening automatically in the background. You won't, we won't be able to get the customers the actual hard copy, the proof of that, if you want to, to put it like that, until we can process those and get the letters out and all of that, which will take a week to 10 days. But from the, the minute and the day that, that we put it into the system on our system, overnight, all of those are backed up into the tax system. And that is an automatic thing that the, um, the customer doesn't need to, you know, do, do anything to make happen. You say they just need to go to the post office and tax their cars then? They are, or go on, a lot of this stuff is done online. Okay. Okay. So that's where the advantage of the online. Uh, what, I, uh, what I can't answer for you is if you're looking to have a, you know, a paper copy, your paper copy is going to be the wrong one and the, with the wrong date. Um, but online, the way the online systems work, uh, which most people do use these days, um, they will pick it up automatically and you don't need your hard copy anymore in the way that you would have used to. Okay. Um, so, but anybody who's trying to do it hard copy will, will have a different issue, I, I suspect. But uh, mm -hmm. online will work. In terms of the current capacity, just using the heavy goods vehicle uh, testing line, you know, I'm just I'm familiar with Lars, where I go to MOT, and um, there'll be two light vehicles uh, lines and one heavy goods vehicle. So my estimation from that, you will be down to a third, a quarter capacity. What capacity currently exists? Yeah, that, that is the normal kind of relationship <coughs> between the lanes in each, in each test centre. Some of them are bigger, like St Newton-Ards yeah. is considerably bigger. In terms of the capacity issue and can we get all the taxis and four-year-old cars through, which is uh, the, the important issue, um, we are looking at that, and that was um, that may have all been looked at while I've been sitting here. Um, um, in that, we are looking at today's taxis and today's four-year-old cars that needed to be pulled through, and getting getting in contact with those customers to try and bring them through. The heavy duty lane normally stops at five o'clock. Uh, and we're obviously uh, looking to extend that into the evening um, in that the MOT centres generally are open into the evening, but normally the heavy duty one will stop and the other light ones will continue. So we do have extra capacity there that we can automatically bring in um, because we will have both the staff and the availability of, of, of appointments within each centre to, to fill bookings each evening. But we, we need to fill them with the right cars so rather than people turning up to those, we will be contacting the customers to arrange those appointments with them for the cars and the taxis that need them to be prioritised, putting everybody else into the temporary exemption category. Last summer when there was quite a, a backlog, uh, I myself was looking at Enniskill and Armagh, Coleraine at one stage just yeah. to get my own, my own car. Uh, through the MOT, uh, so you know, people can be people can be well, well actually uh, accept inconvenience in order to get their vehicle on the road. So, to what extent are you extending the shift system so that as many opportunities as uh, as possible will be available? I mean, are you running a three shift, four shift system? What are you, what are you planning to do? We currently run a two shift system, um, and you're absolutely right. One of the things we're looking at is to look with our staff and our trade union side about how we um, can extend capacity in on those lanes. Um, so currently, MOTs will, you know, you know, they've got a set number of hours. You know, we already had put because of the demand issues on. We have extra. Um, uh, uh, testers trained, we have Sunday opening, uh, all of those things were all in place, but you're absolutely right, what we are looking at now is how do we extend particularly that lane and how do we get maximum capacity on that lane, but we will need to work with our staff and with our trade union side to ensure that that is something we can, but you, that, is, that is absolutely being looked at as we speak. Okay. This four, four month extension is actually creating huge pressure for four months time when it will be doubling up. Yeah. So. In order, frankly, to get over this huge problem, this is a huge problem that the whole country has at the minute, which could see uh, 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 lots of vehicles uh, not legally on our roads uh, and huge inconvenience. So are you, what, what emergency, emergency legislation is required in order to extend the first year in which MOT is required and can that be moved quickly? And then the final question that I have is around the nature of the contracts. It was PFI, type agreement that put all this equipment in, um, what was the life guarantee with that PFI? Um, uh, there are repetitive 
movements as part of the testing process, testing, I suppose it's, it's ball joints and uh, uh, the track rod ends and all sorts of things. So there's this vibration, repetitive vibrationary movement, which almost obviously creates a stress and is likely to have contributed uh, to the failure and, and, the, and the, the cracks. So is it clear? Is that a fault of the manufacturer? Uh, or is that a fault of not replacing uh, these heavily used components? And obviously I would expect that to be a, a conversation with the supplier around all of that and about how we use the lifts and what their maintenance regime was doing and, and, and all of that. Um, I don't have with me, we can get obviously what the life of the existing lifts uh, are. On the legislative point and about extending, um, you'll appreciate that up until last night, uh, we had the four months extension in. In that four month extension, we were saying in order to manage demand that we potentially would pull through people earlier. So the, the thought process had been that get the situation under control, put the four month extension, temporary exemptions in, and if we can, in order to manage demand, bring people earlier in the four months to stagger. So we do, you're absolutely right to avoid a spike in four months' time. Um, that DBA would have been putting steps in to do that, and that was all part of it as well. Um, obviously, as of yesterday evening, it uh, has got escalated into a much larger volume issue and we will need to be looking to see, well, what does that mean? Um, at the moment, the priority has been on those who, whose MOTs are expiring today um, and resolving that. A lot of what you're describing, I wouldn't disagree with you in terms of things that we need to look at, but you'll appreciate between last night and this morning, uh, we haven't quite uh, got on top of all of that. You're, we, this is an unacceptable position, there's no doubt about it, um, and there are many layers to be worked through about options, about how we move this forward and get it back into control, and that's exactly where the Minister wants us to be. Uh, yes, review how this happened, but equally ensure this doesn't happen again, but also take steps to urgently get us back and safely get us back into normal operational mode which will include dealing with capacity issues because back to the points of earlier um, we have capacity uh, the demand is is high it will continue to be high through to <coughs> our summertime which is the issues of last year um, we had put in place lots of steps to manage all of that um, and to increase capacity generally in the network um, um, and obviously we'll need to reflect on all of that now in terms of how do we, you know, what does all this mean when you when you put and forecast um, uh, the, the demand further through the rest of the year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I do welcome the assurances given in relation to the whole issue with regards to the reserves that DVA hold. I think that is assuring. But for me, um, I think it's important, and I would seek to ask a question really, whether there will be an expiration or a compensation from the supplier, because using the reserves to affect the repairs and or the replacements, um, those reserves are then going to end up having to be um, sort of topped up again. And um, from the line of questioning or the line of discussion around this would have been that the way to do that then would be to pass on the charge to motorists around that if we're not going to have a, a charge to the public purse in relation to that. So it's really whether there's going to be an expiration really in terms of compensation from the supplier. Um, I would also would agree with Mr Hilditch around the whole issue in relation to health and safety. The health and safety of staff and customers must be of paramount concern in all of this. And that must be the dominant factor. So whatever we do has to be about ensuring that the health and safety of staff and customers is of paramount concern and uh, going forward. Um, the other issue really related to that was that we were talking about eight weekly and six monthly inspections and whether those were inspections throughout the life of the contract or whether they've just been recently. Um, those have been, as I understand it, through the life, and there's been no change in those um, um, maintenance regimes, if you like, um, in, in recent times or anything. That, that's been standard. Um, in, I couldn't agree more with the health and safety point. That is why we have taken all the lifts down rather than continuing to operate um, You know, some of them. Are, um, now, we may be able to take a view on that uh, if we get more assurances on that. But as of last night, we took them all down all about health and safety, so completely in that space. In terms of discussions with supplier, and I think you've both raised the issues, in fact all of you nearly have, in terms of um, 
the you know who what did they do were they doing their jobs right who's responsible for it were we doing our jobs right all of those questions are highly valid questions and i expect those conversations <coughs> to continue um and we will be on those conversations absolutely um something like this you you, you immediately need to turn to your contract with your supplier and establish the whether they are fulfilling the duties within that contract or not and therefore you you follow the food and the the, the train of thought there so uh, we will we will absolutely do that um, but obviously have not had the opportunity to follow that through i think that's welcome but i think it is important we there is an expiration really in relation to compensation not just for the cost of the repairs or replacements but also the inconvenience to motorists uh, around northern ireland so it's something that's very important but if that wasn't to be successful, obviously there's been talk about using the reserves to cover the cost of this, but mm -hmm. um, would the thought be then if that had to occur, then how would we actually uh, bring the reserves back to the, the sufficient level in relation to that? Uh, we would initially look within DBA to establish what that would uh, mean. Um, I mean, at the, these lifts would have, uh, I don't want to sort of overplay that, because the lifts would have needed to be replaced at some point. They weren't going to last forever. Mm -hmm. So at some point they were going to have to be bought. This has just brought it into a very cold and urgent uh, position. Um, but those reserves would have been used to buy lifts at some point. Uh, it just may mean that they're being bought earlier than maybe would have been the case. Do we have an idea in terms of when the, we were invested? Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, but um, you know what we will need to ensure is that public, whether it's reserves or not, it's still public funds. It still needs to be done appropriately. Procurements have to be done properly. Uh, and public expenditure needs to be protected uh, at the same time as ensuring that we've got a fit for purpose service and that we're protecting our, our employees and our customers. And that's what we're trying to work through uh, very quickly and urgently at this point in time. Um, yeah. Just one last question. Obviously, there's a four month extension that's uh, being granted. Uh, the concern is that, you know, what we talked about last summer in terms of the capacity of DVA, that, you know, the longer this goes on, the days, weeks, potentially months, lists of people who are going to be needing to get uh, an MOT certificate is going to increase, and uh, whether there's an ability within legislation to further extend that, but also I have a concern around that, because the more extensions we have, obviously it's a voter's responsibility to ensure that their vehicle is roadworthy, but there's a higher and higher and higher risk in terms of road safety, in terms of vehicles being on the road, uh, and uh, whether there's an ability to extend that, but also that view in terms of that risk. To road safety. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the road safety point cannot be lost in the middle of all of this. We need to ensure that our, our cars on the road are, are safe. So, in balancing up how quickly, you know, what what is the right and the most appropriate solution uh, to resolve it, um, and looking at the options in that, um, how quickly can that whatever that solution is be put in place, um, and then figuring out from that, well, what does that mean for capacity at a point? And therefore, what do we need and demand, and what do we potentially then need to do around anything and any levers that we might have um, to to deal with a, a spike in demand at particular points? So um, that's that's something that will become clearer as we work through those steps, which we will need to do very quickly, uh, very urgently, um, to establish exactly that we are when we are operational that we have confidence that we will be able to meet the demand. In one way, the uh, the events of last summer. Um, it means we have already taken considerable extra steps to put in place extra uh, testers to uh, do the Sunday openings pretty routinely now um, um, and actually uh, you know, understand our forecasting and our demand models better. So some of that will actually help us in good stead about understanding um, if, uh, based on a period of time, what will then happen further down the track. But we need to do the work to enable us to then figure out, well, what will that mean for customers? How do we manage demand? And what are our options around doing that? And that's all work that is um, kicking off. Can the four month be extended? Um, I don't, I don't want to actually answer that because my, 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 my logic says, well, I presume it can, but I, I don't want to promise that. Um, and that, you know, it, um, can you do, I don't, there's, it'll be legislative driven that. So I really don't want to, uh, to promise something that maybe is not possible to be done. Uh, but all I could assure the committee was we will be looking at all sorts of options. But your point is still valid. You can't extend them 
you know, there's a road safety right. point within it too, and therefore you don't want to be um, no. extending for a, a long period of time either. So, but I can assure the committee we will be looking at it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boyle. You want to come in just, on one just of those a quick one, Chair, because it's something the committee will have to look at. I, I do appreciate the Raya's mentioned and the chair also mentioned C the four year rule in terms of maybe lo legislatively looking at the five years for one year, if you consider that, because. That's counter. You're, you're trying to do all this in the four-month period to try and address that. Yep. You know, and we might, as a committee, might support for one more year extending the the, the year of the car for one year. But I just, as part of all that argument, there's going to be a financial impact on all that, and that would need to be brought to the table if we were to support it. It's just something. But I, looking at, it, I think it's a way out for for the department for for all of us to give it one year's extension. To get over this, for even the four minutes rule, okay. but we need to just seriously look at ah, the absolutely. impact in terms of safety and all of that. So, thanks, Chair. Just one minute. Okay, Miss Kimmel. Yeah, and thanks, Julie. I suppose it's been very helpful for a lot of us in terms of um, the tax and insurance one. That's one that we've all been hit on. So, <coughs> we're able to communicate that information out um, as quickly as possible. I think that will <coughs> really help because I don't think there has been anything out that's clear and 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 letting people know where they stand in relation to that. Just, I suppose, a quick, like, couple of quick points, and it kind of uh, leads on from what Mr Buchanan and Mr Moore was saying there in relation to if, you know, if it is a fault in terms of manufacturing. Um, I suppose my concern would be going forward that, you know, because I suppose that this issue has all occurred nearly in such a short period of time, um, it, there's quite a high possibility that it has been an issue with <coughs> the equipment itself, and that's why, but we don't know that yet. Um, so going forward, will there be an investigation in terms of the standards of, of the inspection? Um, and additionally, then, should we be looking at, because, you know, I know there'll be a procurement process um, for replacements and things like that, but um, that's not to say that we won't be faced with something like this again. So should we be looking at the frequency of inspections for, for um, a period going forward to ensure that things are picked up? Much more quickly, and as I said, it's not we're not hit with it all at once, so that it's, it's we've been easier to deal with. So um. we we need to understand all of this mm -hmm. a, a lot better. Absolutely, um, I think the frequency, you know, how you set up a new contract, um, you know, who do you procure from, how do you run that procurement, um, how do you set up that contract. What do you do about maintenance and inspections? Uh, you know, and who should carry them out? And do you need secondary checks around all of that? I think all of that will need to be looked at. Um, Minister is absolutely um, um, very keen that we have a review to understand both what has happened here, uh, which will include uh, considering the supplier angle on that, but obviously will include DVA as well. Um, and then to ensure that we have the right arrangements in place to prevent it happening again. Um, so that is that is the course of action that we're on, and we just need to work our way through the various steps of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McCartney. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I, I don't want to dwell on the practical what you're working through, but it, it just strikes me about you know like there could be a 20-year-old veil getting a four-month exemption, whereas a, a four-year-old, you know, it's, it seems. You know, it just seems a bit imponderable that you know you, you can't go for the year. But I, I can understand all your reasons. I don't want to go into that. But the, the thing that sort of strikes me about it is, is that the first fault w w was discovered in November, okay, and then you said on the 15th of January there there was 48. You know, I, I take it you know the 47 hour ones it didn't happen on the 14th. It, it, is there a trail, a, a direct trail? Of when these were detected, I'm sure an inspector would say it was on the, you know, the the, the 13th of November at 10:45. I was inspecting and found. So there, there will be a timeline between the first and the 40th. There, there absolutely will be. Yeah. Um, as the as the um, <coughs> and that period, I guess, is from you know November into the early part of January. Yeah. Um, in terms of that, and as the cracks are being identified. There's there, the supplier is still saying no, con, you know, no safety concerns. So to the, so to the points raised about uh, employees and, and protection and all of that, that was well, you know, understood um, and being worked through. Equally, repairs would also have been put being put in place, um, and in an operational environment, um, you know. Uh, equipment having faults needing to be repaired and whatever that's all part of, of doing the business uh, in any operational environment this has just ended up at a point 
where it has escalated in a, in a way that had, we've had no um, history of. Uh, and, there, and when your supplier is telling you, <coughs> you know, as of last night, we can't give you sufficient assurances, that's where we've ended up. Um, in terms of the uh, inspection regimes, they were on inspections, they were being repaired, they were being reinspected. All of those things were, were being worked through. Um, um, but it escalates exceptionally quickly in a very, very short piece of time. And we need to understand why. Yeah, I, I can understand that, but I mean, 48, you know, it's somewhere along the line, it would strike me that there was a tipping point. It's the same, same lift, the same manufacturer and same supplier. The 48 seems to be a high number before you declared, if you like, an emergency. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were... Uh, was any question asked at any time? Uh, was there a fault in the same machine elsewhere uh, but that the supplier gave them to some other industry or some other equivalent agency? We need to look at that with the supplier. And I, 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 I know, I, I know, I, we, I know, we have to look at it. But yeah. I'm asking, has it been looked at? Because this happened in November. Uh, that's the 15th of January. So they say we have to look at it. In my opinion, it isn't the answer which I'm looking for. I want someone to say, yes, we did. Because if you were buying anything and you seen 48 faults, you know, if you bought a new car and, and there was 48 faults within a short period, you would be back to the supplier saying, that's not the car I bought and it's under warranty. Uh, so, therefore, that's why I'm asking that question. And, I completely understand yeah, yeah, the question, yeah. and I just personally can't answer it, but yeah. we can absolutely get you an answer about whether it has been asked to date. Absolutely. Yeah, and you see, on, on, in terms of the legal status, and this might sound a silly question, who owns the lifts? Is it the DVA? We've or, bought them, so there are lifts. The, you, yeah. They're your lifts, yeah. right, OK. Uh, the, and the, it's the supplier provides the inspector or the DVA? Supplier uh, subcontracts out both the maintenance and the inspecting. Yeah. Through and contract, so we have our contract is with the yeah. supplier, and they subcontract both yeah. repairs and the inspection, and the inspection is through an insurance company. Yeah. So, but no, without prejudice, perhaps that's something we could be looking at in terms of yep. the inspection. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I just I just noticed in the in the first day brief for the minister, and I, I, I'm not sure what she's going to say about it. But I, I, this wasn't flagged up on the first day brief. No, uh, is that a mistake? Um, this, the first day brief was done, what, around the 11th of the January? 11th of January, so yeah. somewhere in there. The report on the 48th of the 55 comes in on the 15th of January. See, see that's why it's critical. Yeah. And I think it's something the committee will come back to. I, I would like to see the timeline, you know, because I, I have to say it would be nearly incredulous to believe that you find these all on the 14th of January. And if there's a steady timeline from November and into December and into January, then there will be more questions asked as to why this wasn't flagged up earlier and it didn't become an issue earlier. And, and again, back to, I absolutely accept that yeah. point and it obviously will need to be looked at. Um, the supplier, even on that 15th of January, was saying no concerns about those lifts, but um, I appreciate that the timeline yeah, needs to be looked at. I, I, I don't know who the supplier is, so I, don't, I, I, I yeah. say this without prejudice, but, uh, you know, I, yeah. I would say that, wouldn't I? Like, no, I mean, and that's, that's without prejudice. But you know, if there are, if there's other uh, instances that <coughs> this is happening, then, then it adds to it. And we're asking questions some, somewhat in the blind. But you know, 48 lifts, you know, all cracked. You know, there, there, there's just something. There's a design fault or, or something. And if you have a timeline running from yeah. November into January, then I think people will ask questions to ask the way it wasn't flagged up earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Let me again just on the uh, communication that I'd mentioned earlier. Uh, on another aspect of that, do you feel that the department and DVA maybe acted in haste yesterday in relation to trying to get a good news story out for the minister, but hence causing the minister some embarrassment, considering there was going to be further very serious questions asked later in the day? Um, as we knew it, that's, that's where we were. We wanted to make sure that people knew that the temporary exemption certificate. Uh, process that she had asked us to look at, that we had got that working, because it was really, really important for people to know that that procedure was going to give them protection and allow them to drive. Um, so we wanted to get that out to the public, and we wanted to also give respect to the Assembly process and to make sure Assembly, assembly colleagues were notified so about it as well. So the afternoon news then came as somewhat of a shock to you then? 
uh, yesterday evening came as a big Good. shock. Yes. Okay. Thank well, you. What, what, what became a shock? The fact that the supplier said that they didn't have sufficient assurance over the repairs that were in place. Did them not in it? Okay, Mr. Buchanan. Uh, but did they say what the nature? Was the, 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 are you saying now that the lifts were can't be repaired? We don't know that. That's right. that's okay. part of the process. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what we will do, uh, and what I uh, I suspect where we're at, um, even as we speak, is about getting another assessment, independent assessment, yeah. of of the uh, of the position, so we understand exactly what we need to do next. Okay, Mr. Buchanan. Right, just on the supplier. Obviously, the supplier is dealing with. The 48 lifts here in Northern Ireland for, for, for use, okay? You told me earlier they're a worldwide supplier. Uh -huh. So the worldwide industry is going to be saying, there's a problem with these lifts. Have you any concerns that the supplier could get to be in trouble? Or indeed, have they enough resources working on, or in your 48 lifts? Because no doubt England and Wales and Scotland, if there's lifts over there, whether it be in private garages or in centres or across worldwide, is this company going to be in any pressure? And is there a plan B in that? Because if the lifts across the world has now suddenly got a problem. That company can be a problem. Are you confident you have enough they have enough resources working on our 48 lifts? Well, our, our concentration is obviously in finding a solution that works for, for DBA. You're absolutely right. Are there wider ramifications which, we, which the supplier may have to work through? That's obviously for them to, to deal with. Um, the important thing is that we understand what our lifts are, uh, what are the options on our lifts, and what can we do about them. Um, is repair the answer? Is uh, replacement of parts the answer? Is purchase of new lifts the answer? That's the process we need to work through. Um, and then where does the supplier fit in, both backwards in terms of what has happened to date, and then forwards in terms of where we need to go for the future. Mm. All of that, all of that, I mean, uh, we, we, I couldn't agree more that needs to be looked at and needs to be very much um, worked through with the supplier with our interests and with our customers and employees' interests uh, at the heart of that. Julie, you're, you're talking here weeks, not days. Well, if we have to, I mean, that was uh, on the uh, media this morning in terms of if we have to find that we have to buy new lifts uh, and that's the answer and then they have to be put into place, then that obviously, but in terms of exactly, it would be wrong of me to speculate exactly what is going to happen here because we just need to do the work. And I think it's appropriate that we, are, we do that. Uh, I can completely, completely understand all the committee's questions. Um, absolutely. Um, and we have to do the work now to get both you the answers, us the answers, minister the answers, um, and be able to, so having put steps in place to keep the operational side operating, we, we need to, to put the steps in place around how did we get here, what does it mean for the supplier? Who's paying for it? All of those questions that you have asked, that's the course of action. And there's multiple channels of work that need to be very, very quickly moved forward on, and they will be. OK, thank you, Mr Beggs. Yeah, just, uh, in terms of the, the failure of the cracks, is it the same component or the same small number of components that have failed repetitively over the whole uh, list? And as such, is it a matter of re potentially replacing individual components rather than going through a six-month procurement exercise for a new supply of lifts? lifts? So, so will you be ensuring that we look for short-term as well as long-term solutions uh, here? We will be looking at all options, absolutely, because uh, what, what we don't want to do, mind you, is to act to do something which then... Um, but, you know, doesn't last or whatever. So we do need to find something that, that is workable, and that is a good use of public funds, and that provides an effective service. So, but we will be absolutely looking at both short term and long term. And so you said it's the same you component know, that's. Failed. It's on the scissor arms of the lift. Yeah, the cracks are on the on the scissor arms of the lift. Okay, thank you. Any other members wish to ask any further questions at this stage on this item? Chair, Chair just to remember, it's, it's public money on their public lifts. I appreciate contract and subcontract, but at the end of the day there are lifts and we have a responsibility to make sure that every pound been spent on safe for the workers and everybody yes, else. Safety. That's the most safety. important thing. I, I appreciate the, the issue that, and there's going to be questions over subcontract and contracts and on procurement and all of that. You know? Safety. Totally. I couldn't okay. agree more. 
Right, Thank please. you. Um, we'll obviously be returning to this many times over the next number of weeks and perhaps months um, until this is brought to a conclusion. So thank you very much, Julie, for, for, for taking questions on that, on that item, which is incredibly topical. Um, to go back then to um, what we had intended this, this session to be in relation to, which was an overview of the department. Yep. Um, I'm not sure whether each of you wanted to maybe give a short synopsis of yeah, each of your areas of work and then perhaps then move into further questions. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll open up some overviews and talk with my group and then Andrew and we talk as long as possible to give Julie a break. <laughs> um, and, uh, I do apologise, I have to nip out just to yeah. take any questions. Um, first of all, as I said earlier, sure, we're very happy to be back with the committee again. Obviously, we operate on the direction of the Minister, but we will aim going forward to the committee as much as possible in its work. And we do look forward to future exchanges. It's very conscious being in the building last week. It's, I've been here for two and a half years. It was very strange when our colleagues wrote with you last week. We're also conscious, just reviewing coming here, that DFI had only been in existence for nine months before the hiatus in the institutions. I do remember brought together DRD, some significant elements of DOE and some other functions and DCAL and indeed follow with them. Over the period since it was in established, we've worked actually to move to greater focus across the department beyond sort of hard infrastructure, whether it's water, road, or rail, or public transport. The infrastructure sense is a means to an end. The end is to improve the well being of this place and the people of this place. So we see the department's purpose very much now as to connect people safely, to support opportunities and create sustainable living places. And we think that fits well in a world where we have an outcome based PFG and we're looking for collaboration across departments. It also chimes well with her own minister's views and her role <coughs> and that of the department. In terms of the programme for government, where we lead in indicators around outcome 11, we see ourselves as a contributing, potentially contributing to a number of other outcomes, particularly outcome two around the environment. We'll come back to that. So as I said, I would then propose to just do a run ahead on what my group does, and then obviously allow Andrew to pick up on his. We'll obviously be describing what we've done and to a certain extent where we've got to here. Where we go in the future, I think we'll be for the minister to talk about which is here next week, because that's happy enough. So looking at my group, my group is Transport and Resources. Um, I own some of the cor corporate functions, which I talk about, and I'm also responsible for overall transport in a way, in a sense, policy, planning and strategy. <coughs> in terms of, and the first day brief you have identifies the directors in charge of each group, so I won't go into the sort of detail on that. In terms of corporate, we have a corporate policy and planning unit whose core role is to support the minister and the service we provide to the Assembly in terms of Assembly questions and support for this dialogue here with the Committee. Um, and obviously the support for the Minister is a key role, and at the minute we're tooling back up again, having the um, boss balls for the next part of three years, and that is proving challenging in some cases. Um, we've all took corporate functions in that operation, including statistics and communications, and we also had a public appointments unit. You know, we have a number of public appointments to public bodies, and we like to think we run a fairly professional operation in terms of the appointments to those bodies. Uh, there'll be a pick-up of appointments now with the return of the minister and the switch back from some appointments which had been going towards the Secretary of State the former order. Um, finance falls within my patch. It's a pivotal responsibility in this department. Um, we are a big direct spending department, both in roadside and others, and have large NDPBs. Um, we have the biggest capital spend in the block, and we have a number of major projects, including flagships, so we churn through a lot of money. Um, we have been operating in a severe budget constraints for about since about 2015, which has meant that tight financial management has been to the fore. We've been in that regime for five odd years now. Um, I like to think that we make the best of our money. We tend not to surrender any money um, unless there's some slips and flagship projects, but we can always take that money back and we tend to spend to the full both some resource and uh, capital. Um, and over the years, the block has benefited from 
former DRD and now DFI have been able to soak up capital spend towards the end of the year. Somebody we can do it on direct drive, particularly in Andrew's area. Um, and I think finance will be a featuring, continuing feature of the engagement we have with the committee. I think, Chair, you have some from the already with some of those financial issues from <laughs> former rules. Um, transport policy and planning. The director has overall responsibility for transport planning and policy. Um, at the minute, we're doing work on the next suite of transport plans, which has been highlighted. Um, a regional strategic transport network plan, which will be the first coming along over this year, a new Belfast Metropolitan Transport Plan, a North West Transport Plan, and in a sense, a sub regional transport plan. Those four plans will be brought along for public consultation over the period ahead, and they will shape investment, particularly the first plan. Part of that work also, though, is in supporting local government and their LDP process. We provide evidence to all the councils for them to take count of as they move forward with their LDP process. So that's a, um, a key work we're doing with our planning colleagues in the department and with local government. Obviously, it's a bit complex because uh, the timetable for the local government LDPs is each one has its own timetable, which is stretched out. And therefore, producing a Belfast Metropolitan Plan covering five or six local government areas, all at different pace, pace, the steps of their LDB process is going to be complex. Uh, we also have a role on transport legislation there, both strategic level and also a, the raft of subordinate legislation we bring forward to changes in by lanes and stuff like that on Andrew's side. But that division also is the lead now in the department's work around climate change. We took a view last year that we had huge potential to make a contribution on climate change, but we need to organise ourselves a bit better. Do we see ourselves as having a major contributor to around <coughs> climate change, both in terms of clean air and issues like that? <coughs> so at the minute we're working closely with dear colleagues on the clean air strategy, we're working with the uh, economy colleagues on the energy strategy, and that's a piece of work we will want to expand as we go forward. And I know it's it's close to the minister's heart. Um, obviously, moving, for example, to low emission public transport fleets initially that would be a key thing. But investments, the key there. <coughs> In public transport, we have three or four key roles. We are the, <coughs> sorry, sir, the sponsor of transit, which is a major public body. And providing the uh, expansive public transport network we have at the minute. Clearly, we have a number of issues around our funding of Chancellor, which has gone on for a number of years <coughs> and has, is of critical <coughs> in the next budget process. We're dealing with the process to deal with a number of applications for permits from a number of private sector operators, which is um, proving complex and time consuming, and that's a major issue which will go to the, to the Minister before long. Um, our agreement with Translink, the public service agreement, which was required under EU regulations, which needs to be renewed in two years' time. And therefore, we'll be working up a proposition for what that agreement looks like, what are the measures and the metrics in it, what are the ambitions in it in terms of what Translink should be contributing in public transport to the wider public government and issues like that. And that will be clearly something we will want to have a dialogue with the committee on over the next couple of years. And it offers, certainly in our view, a, a way of rebooting what we think about public transport and potentially what the role of the private sector would be. And then we run the concession fare scheme, which members will be familiar with, which is the most generous scheme of its nature in these islands, but will face challenges in terms of affordability as we go forward. And as the population lives longer and the demographic gets older, cost of that scheme, the trajectory of spend will go like that, unless the block can find the funding for that. Um, I think ministers will have to look at some uh, curtailment of eligibility. We provide the funding for community transport, Belfast and beyond, and again we've had issues of funding of recent years, um, and we fund also their, uh, oversee the contract for the Rothwood Ferry, um, so that's the bundle of issues in public transport. Um, in terms of we have a relatively new directorate from last September, which deals with Gateway and EU relations. We've been a very busy department in terms of Brexit the last two or three years. It wasn't evident at first initial work, but the fact that 
but let's focus on how goods move, both east, west, north, south, speed of that, and issues of that is meant that was in terms of a responsibility for regulation of drivers, driver licences, issues like that, um, responsibility for the enterprise. We have become a more heavy exit department once you get over the major departments for economy and um, DERA. Uh, and this directed needs on that, but work on Brexit is spread across the entire department, particularly on the policy side. At Gateway, at the division also has responsibility for relations with, with sort of Gateway, principally the ports, the trust ports, for which the Minister has rights of appointment, and the airports, where we have some medicine for responsibility. We also have responsibility for inland waterways, which we took over from the former decal. And we offer there also oversight of Waterways Ireland. Um, and finally, but certainly not least in that directorate, is the whole uh, initiative around active travel, cycling and walking. In the last few years, we've done as much of a push on walking as a mode of transport as well as cycling. And I've been doing quite a lot of work with the Public Health Agency in terms of promoting that. So uh, a mixed and diverse um, directorate there. The final policy one is safe and sustainable travel, where we have a lot of responsibility for the regulation, for example, of regulation of the bus, buses, regulation of taxis, um, the regulation of, of fate itself, uh, driving licences, insurance, uh, driver behaviour, whether it's drink driving, use of mobile phones, all that sort of behaviour, regulation, and also for road safety. And our road safety strategy will be coming to an end before long. And one of the things we're going to be working with the new minister on is what would a new road safety strategy look like? And I think we'll be often the that maybe it should look different. We're doing a lot of work at the minute um, in a couple of our divisions about how, in particular, Belfast city centre works and perhaps we need to be looking at a world where there will be less cars in the city centre. It's, it's a nicer place to move. The less cars are about, the easier it will be to get to tackle road safety issues. So our agenda is blend in that. And the final direct direct that I have is around digital services, where we have a we have a big digital agenda. I know it's slightly paradoxical, but you know, in terms of the DVA and a lot of the services and on the side, we are one of the biggest digital delivery departments in in the NICS and are moving to increase that and improve the um, service to customers uh, or Digital service branch is one of the most um, innovative in the NICS. We're also in charge of in that area, informa information management and security. With cyber security becoming a really big issue at the moment, um, and we do a fairly good job on that end. And that just about covers a brief counter through my but just conscious of time. So I'll happy to take any questions once Andrew and puts Julie to cover. Okay. If you're happy enough. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Move swiftly on then to the Roads and Rivers Group. I know around the table there are some people who will be quite familiar with the Roads part in particular. Uh, the Roads and Rivers Group was formed in May 2016, whenever the DFI was formed. Uh, it's a big group of people. It's more than half of the department staff-wise is within Roads and Rivers. Generally the biggest spending area. The Roads part is the biggest highway authority in the UK and Ireland. And big drainage authority within rivers as well, so it's uh, a big area, a lot of frontline activities uh, which will, I'm sure, going forward be of interest to this activity. Uh, a lot of the work we do is fairly invisible when it goes well, it's a bit like DVA, it's pretty invisible when it goes well, when something goes wrong it's very high profile. Uh, Roads and Rivers is about 1,800 people strong, it's managed into four directorates and the director duties were actually adjusted in August of last year, so this is the first time we've had a chance to present the, the new director structure, and you'll see it in the belatedly delivered uh, first day brief. There's pictures of the directors and a brief outline of the responsibilities. Um, I think it's probably best if I go through the, the four directors briefly and what their duties are. I'll give you a, a, an opportunity to see the range of things that we carry out. First of all, network services is looked after by Conor Lochrey. That's one of three directors on the roads side of the organisation. And Network Services looks after the maintenance of the road network. And the road network is Northern Ireland. Uh, financially, it's its most valuable asset. It's, it's worth about £30 billion. Pounds, and we need to spend quite a bit of money each year. We, sh we should be spending about £140 million pounds a year in maintaining it to keep it into the condition that it's currently in. So 
The maintenance work that Connor undertakes is partly resurfacing structural <coughs> maintenance work, which is required every, every so often, depending on the type of road. And he also looks at the reactive maintenance. So that's the pothole repairs, it's the grass cutting, it's the gully cleaning. Um, it also is the traffic signs, road markings, traffic signals, street lights, and the maintenance of bridges and structures. There was a, a very big maintenance burden <coughs> which the, the department has to undertake there. Uh, the biggest issue in past years has been the lack of funding, and we've generally started off the year with a restricted maintenance service. We've been delivering that since 14-15 now, our service. And in, in many years, including this year, our allocation at the start of the year has not been sufficient to deliver those services for the full year. Connor also looks after the management of the road network, so that's traffic management. We have a traffic control centre in Belfast, looks after all of the traffic signals, including the maintenance of those and the setting of those. He looks after development control and private streets, so within the planning process, roads is a statutory consultee, so we would comment on traffic progression, safety and parking issues for any new development. And we look at the private streets process, so that when a development is completed, we look after the process of how that is adopted and becomes part of the adopted road network for maintenance purposes. We also set regulations uh, in relation to things like parking, residence parking schemes. Development. Uh, Connor looks after some development, not the biggest road schemes, but he looks after all of the other developments on the road network. We call them local transport and safety measures. And they can range from things like new roundabouts, new pedestrian crossings, uh, new footways, new <coughs> bus priority schemes, new car parks for park and ride. Up, up. Try doesn't do park and ride. Um, we look after winter service and the client part of winter service that Connor looks after. So he would be the one that makes the call and makes sure that we follow the departmental policy on winter service. Uh, winter service is one of the areas where we didn't get enough money at the start of this year to deliver the service for the full year, and we're watching the weather conditions very carefully now, and the, the monitoring round very carefully to see how we're going to be fixed for the rest of the year. Uh, also looks after street lighting. So street lighting is another one of the areas where we didn't get enough money at the beginning of this year to run the full service, and in fact, most street lighting repairs had to be stopped in November. And there's a very restricted service being carried out in the street lighting there. Uh, finally, within Connor's area, he is the lead uh, for the department in relation to flags and bonfires, which uh, raise their heads at various times in the year and for, for quite a long part of the year. Uh, moving on, then, the Director of Engineering is Deidre Backel. Deidre is head of the profession of civil engineers in the department and she therefore looks after the uh, recruitment staff, progression staff, development and making sure we have enough chartered engineers in the organisation, which is becoming quite challenging. Um, Deidre's responsibility include looking after the internal consultant organisation, so we have our own technical civil engineering expertise that delivers a lot of the functions that we, we carry out within Roads and Rivers. She also looks at the internal contractor on the roads side, so that's the people who actually do the pothole repairs, a lot of the grass cutting, and, and who are currently delivering a winter service. Uh, other functions within the engineering directorate include the enforcement of parking regulations and moving traffic regulations, public liability claims, plans, which are often required for, for road schemes. She looks after engineering policy, health and safety, Strangford Ferry, and the issuing of blue badges. So quite a, a range of extra of engineering and administrative functions within the engineering directorate. Moving on then, the director of major projects and procurement is John Irvine. I said a lot of the things that we do are invisible when they're running well. Uh, major projects is certainly not invisible when it's running well. Uh, John looks after the delivery of our executive flagship projects. So that would be the A5, the A6, and BRT1. And BRT1 has now been delivered, and we're working on BRT through John's team. Uh, the A6 is in the process of being delivered. And as you know, there's 
two contracts underway in the AX6 at, at, at the moment. Uh, when those contracts are finished, they will completely transform that journey from Belfast up to Derry. That's, uh, God bless them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> already benefiting from the first part of the, of the, the, first part of the Randallstown Castle Dawson contract, which was opened last year. Um, working away on the A5 as well to get that through to the public inquiry uh, very shortly. John also looks after city deal projects that have come to the department's way. Uh, that's a developing picture, but so far within the Belfast region city deal, we're delivering the RT2, Lagan Bridge and the Newry Southern Leaf Road, all subject to decisions by the Minister and the Executive, but those, those three schemes are in the heads of terms and will require confirmation, and if they are confirmed, we will be delivering them. There are other schemes as well, uh, which John is progressing uh, on the strategic road network. The York Street interchange is probably the most high profile of those, and a recent legal case, and we're now considering the way ahead. But there's a number of other schemes as well, which are also high, high profile and, and long awaited by various people. Uh, in the likes of Ball and the Hinch and on the A1 safety measures and in the skill. So there's, there's other schemes that are going through the development stage which could be delivered if money is allocated to them. And <coughs> finally, John is also responsible for procurement across roads and rivers. Uh, that's a, an increasingly difficult area for us. Uh, Northern Ireland is, in relation to procurement, Northern Ireland is by far the most litigious part of the UK. Uh, probably down to the shortage of, of major contracts that are going out. Almost everything is challenged. Uh, it's, it's a work area which is very difficult for us and where we need to concentrate a, a lot of expertise. final area of the roads and rivers is the rivers area. It was the old rivers agency that some of you will be familiar with. Uh, the director there is Jonathan McKee, who was appointed last August. Rivers is the drainage authority for Northern Ireland. So they look after flood risk management under the EU Floods Directive. Basically, they provide, maintain and operate a network of flood defences across the province. Uh, the biggest of those is the Belfast Tidal Flood Protection Scheme, which will offer increased protection to the central area of Belfast. Uh, that's a very important thing which we're now delivering. Uh, like many of our areas, rivers is normally quite low profile. Except when there's a flooding event, and then of course they're the highest profile part of the department. So when, when there isn't a flooding event going on, Rivers is basically preparing. <coughs> they're trying to make communities more resilient. They're trying to ensure that we have a better range of flood protection measures in place, and they're also maintaining the flood, flood protection measures that we have. The other significant uh, current area of rivers work is in relation to the 180 controlled reservoirs that we have in Northern Ireland. And within Northern Ireland, the legal position on controlled reservoirs is that the owner is responsible. And, and that's basically it. It's a common law responsibility of the owner to keep people safe. However, there is a, a, a Reservoirs Act, uh, which is coming into force. Uh, subject to the Minister's wishes and so on, but that, when that Act comes into force, there will be a, a, a need to set up a reservoirs authority, and there will be a whole range of control measures and uh, guarantees about safety of reservoirs which are not currently in place. We are in a bit of a transition phase at the minute, and rivers are very carefully managing that transition from the common law responsibility to what will be the case under a reservoir authority. And I imagine that will be something that the committee will want to hear about in more detail in the future. So that was a, a very quick run through the, the responsibilities of, of roads and rivers. Thank you. Okay, and uh, then the remaining bit of the department, if I can. Um Set DBA aside just for now uh, and deal with my other two areas of responsibility, which are planning and water. Um, so, turning to planning first, you're obviously aware of the transfer of the planning functions to councils in 2015, so we're now operating very much a two tier model in planning, um, and therefore the majority of planning applications are determined and decided at council level uh, for local and major applications. In terms of what the department deals with under planning, uh, we, uh, through our strategic planning directorate led by Alistair Beggs, look at the regionally significant applications, um, which are applications above certain thresholds uh, and viewed as, as having regional significance. Um, 
or and called in applications. So where a determination has been made or a decision made that um, the, the department will make the determination on that application uh, through whatever means that may be, a legislative requirement or a request by a third party or a, a decision by a minister, then uh, the Alistair's directorate will look at those particular schemes and take them through to uh, recommendation uh, for final determination. Also within his area is the uh, local development plan process, which uh, I I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. It's the new two-stage process, uh, which uh, involves the publication of a draft plan strategy and a local policies plan. It is the way in which the, the framework for development in local councils uh, is now being done. And obviously, as a department, we have to um, have an appropriate role within that in two ways. One, as uh, a bit like what Andrew has described, as a statutory consultee as part of that process, whether it be from roads or transport or rivers or, or water policy, but also in an oversight role uh, to uh, engage with councils and ensure that those plans are appropriate and that they will be put forward uh, for the test of soundness. That is done through the independent examiner process and that's not a, a departmental role and then that ultimately will come back to the department for final decision. Uh, in terms of where that has got to, all 11 councils have published their preferred options papers and seven councils have published their draft plan strategies and the Belfast plan very recently has gone forward uh, to cause an independent examination. Um, Within planning, there's a second area uh, led by Angus Care, which is where all the development of policy and legislation and guidance uh, is looked after, uh, supporting the planning system in a wide number of ways. And obviously, we'll be very keen to work with the new minister and understand her priorities in, in that place and where we, we go in the future on that. Um, his area also looks at oversight and governance of councils. Um, there's a performance monitoring framework, improving environmental governance uh, and a range of issues around that, albeit uh, all of the other actions that I've talked about, like the LDP process and the called in applications are all part of, of providing oversight to that council arrangement. Um, and Angus's group is uh, look at those call in applications and make recommendations about whether they should be determined by, by the department. So that is kept separate from, from Alistair's. Uh, the final three areas within planning um, are the Crumlin Road Jail, uh, St Lucia and Oma, and uh, policy on Rathlin Island. Um, the, se the second area then under my responsibility is water and drainage policy led by Linda McHugh. Um, several key roles there. Um, the major one is obviously as being the shareholder of Northern Ireland Water, um, which is a departmental uh, NDPB. It is obviously the provider of our water and sewage uh, services across Northern Ireland and a vital service that it provides to, to all of us. Um, I'm sure members of the committee are very, very aware of the funding uh, difficulties for particularly wastewater within Northern Ireland Water and it's an area obviously we are giving considerable attention to. Um, because of the funding issues and the shortfall of funding on wastewater, um, that's leading to constraints on development uh, across Northern Ireland, um, impacting on econ the economy and on housing, uh, and also with potential environmental implications. So it's something we really do need to resolve. Uh, and I think uh, everybody is, is, is very uh, concerned about that and, and is keen to see that happen. Um, within that area, there is the Living with Water programme, which is the uh, investment needed in the infrastructure, water and wastewater infrastructure within the Be Greater Belfast area. Uh, because that needs such investment, we've pulled that out into a separate programme called the Living with Water programme and headed by Simon Richardson. Um, and that uh, will look at options for the Belfast area in particular uh, and really trying to not only deal with the hard infrastructure of the tunnels and the pipes and the wastewater treatment works, but also, and this is uh, I suppose related to climate change, about how do we actually manage our water? Um, what are we as consumers doing about it? Uh, are we using it effectively? Do we value the water that we have? And secondly, are we managing things upstream um, in more um, sustainable ways, more green ways, uh, in order to actually make sure that we are not building those tunnels and, and um, having to deal with things then downstream, which could affect what we dealt with further up, uh, uh, up upstream. 
Um, there, the funding of Northern Ireland Water is regulated, so very much a regulated industry. Uh, it's called the price control process. Um, it's a, I could talk forever on that, but I'll not. Um, we are at a critical phase in it, in that uh, the PC21 period, which is <coughs> 2021 through to 2027, Northern Water is putting its business plan together for the end of this month, the end of January, to, t to give it to the regulator. Um, it's based on social environmental guidance produced by the department, and the um, minister will need to take a view on, on all of that in due course. Um, and the regulator will then make their draft determination. So this is where they will take a view on what the capital requirements are and the operational requirements are for Northern Ireland Water for the next six years. Uh, that's done independently. They will figure out what efficiencies can be put in place and they will, they will look at the impact on the consumers and whether that is legitimate and, and um, viable or not. Uh, and that draft determination is due in June, and then we'll go out to public consultation over the summer, and we'll uh, then come back uh, later in the year. So there's a uh, your timing uh, is actually quite helpful here, I think, from the committee's perspective, because we're just entering that whole process, some of which has involved heavily by the department, and some of which is actually completely out with the department and is run through by the, with the regulator. But I'm sure it's a process that you will want to understand more about. Um, as is the funding issues and how do we resolve them and, and all of that, uh, which given that is, uh, NDPB is subject to all the competing priorities that both John and Andrew have already talked about. Uh, Linda's area also deals with a range of water policy and legislation issues, uh, which again are subject to Minister's views, and they work very closely with Andrews on the likes of flood risk management. Um, we also do work on coastal erosion. Um, so that, I think, if I set aside DVA, if you forgive me, um, but, um, that's the three areas. So I'm happy to take questions on any of the, the areas. Okay, thank you. Sarah, my apologies. The Justice Committee sitting at the same time and I've had a bit of a Okay, no problem. Okay. Um, thank you very much for, for your presentation. Um, I, mean, I suppose selling out, John, you made it quite clear, you know, that the infrastructure is a big spending um, department and there's obviously some very big ticket um, projects which are, have been highlighted through various agreements and so on. I suppose what is quite critical for people to really understand is the impact that infrastructure makes on their daily lives and we all take it very much for granted, be it sort of switching on or turning on our taps or flushing our toilet. Um, the footpaths we walk on, the, the roads we drive on, and so on as well. And I think it's very much take, is taken for granted, uh, but it impacts on, on every citizen right across Northern Ireland. And um, the point that you made about um, you know, spend can be visible, and, um, but yet um, is, is again taken for granted. It's whenever those processes sort of break down and you don't carry out sort of routine maintenance and so on that it becomes a, a problem. And I think probably January monitoring round was very timely yesterday in that it drew members' attention to some of the financial um, pressures that the department does have, given um, what you asked for and, and what you received. But so just in, just in relation to January monitoring, um, and particularly around um, they asked for, for both TransLink and also for um, road maintenance and, and street lighting. Mm. Um, the fact that you didn't receive what you, you asked for, what will the impact be immediately? Well, um, as Andrew's alluded to, on winter service we didn't get what was bid for, therefore at this stage we can't guarantee that we will have sufficient money to get us to the end of the financial year if the weather doesn't turn out. We have the colleagues literally counting sort of how, what is this spent on, and give the detail, but you know, we're a million short of what we thought we needed based on the projections for this year compared to last year. So. And I may sound a bit odd that this is nearly the start of February, but depending on how the weather can go, we can we go through a lot of money. So we are not betting that we will get through without either having to not do some gooding or find money from elsewhere. But that's extremely unlikely at this stage of the year. We have exhausted everything. Just, just for those members who aren't familiar with the, the winter service, yeah. perhaps could you maybe give some detail in relation to whenever we see texts or tweets that the, the gridders have gone out, can you maybe give them an idea of how much that actually costs? I'm very yes. give you that. Uh, I can. It's, it's over, over £80,000. If we, if we do a single 20 gram salt, a standard salt spread over the salted network, that's about £80,000. So your million pounds that we got through the monitoring round buys us about 12 outings. 
Uh, 12 outages can last you a month if there's not terribly bad weather. <coughs> if you have snow, as we had in some parts of the province last night, uh, if you had snow throughout the province, you, you would be doing at least four salting operations a day for your million pounds would go in you know, a very short period. That, that, that's why we're just we're very closely watching the weather. We're more or less at the end of our initial allocation. Now, uh, we were basically relying <coughs> on, on, on the, the monitoring round on anything else we can find in the department. Okay, and, and so really over the last sort of four or five years now you have been operating skeleton service, particularly around road maintenance, um, be that sort of gullies and so mm -hmm. on as well, and also the issue around patching. Um, there have been a number of reports, obviously the audit um, office report and also the, um, the report which you commissioned yourselves by, by Jim Mark. Jim Barton, and it suggests somewhere in the region of £143 million pounds is required per year. Mm -hmm. um, what are you currently operating on, just to put that into some sort of context for, for members? The last two years we have started at £75 million for structural maintenance, and we have added to that during the year. I think we're a bit over £100 million. Just a bit over £100. Over 100 so we're about, we're about £40 million short of, of the target figure to keep the network in its current condition. So, so basically, the network is deteriorating. Each, each year, we spend yeah. less than the structural maintenance funding plan says. The network gets a bit worse, so it's we're underspending by about forty million pounds this year. And that doesn't take into consideration grass cutting, um, patchy. No, no. The structural structural maintenance does have a capital element and a resource element. The capital element is for resurfacing and surface dressing schemes. The resource element is for patching. Uh, so the patching and surface and resurfacing are all part of structural maintenance. That's 143. But it doesn't take account of things like gully emptying, or we've had to reduce the frequency from twice a year to once a year, or grass cutting, which we used to do five times in urban areas, we now do twice. Uh, it, it, it doesn't allow for, for those. Okay, and what discussions then have you had with with finance in relation to um, perhaps baselining structural maintenance? Well, um, I mean, to be clear, the Bart report restates first what we need to spend every year. Julie said the, reg the regulator would tell us what we need to spend on the NIW assets to look after them. <coughs> We've done we're working recently with Transic, for example. We need to spend over fifty million a year on the permanent way to look after that. So because we've a huge amount of physical assets, we probably need north of four hundred million a year just to keep those being looked after. And considering we this year we got four hundred and seventy as an opening allocation, you see the tension. And we we've highlighted the last couple of years there's a tension between Doing the big development schemes, which are important, in this case flagship projects, and looking after the assets you've got. So unless we get an awful lot more capital, we can't square that circle. We need nearly double. And that's, to be honest, before any expectations coming from um, the New Deal, the approach document, etc. We are the biggest capital spending department, but we're not near the amount of level we need to look after the assets that we have custodianship of. Okay. Um, members are um, attending um, TransLink's launch tomorrow um, in relation to hydrogen. the hydrogen, yep. uh, which is incredibly innovative, and, and obviously they're working very hard in, in order to maintain fleet and so on. Yep. Um, and we are aware, obviously, that yesterday, yesterday's monitoring round, they didn't receive certainly the money that was re requested. Um, are aware, obviously, from from the papers that there are there's a critical financial situation with regards to to TransLink. Um, how do you feel? How, what really should we be doing to move that forward? Um, well, the, the, the Transix situation has been a number of years in the making, not, not of Transix making. Uh, when we suffered a bad budget four or five years ago, <coughs> I mean, for Transix was reduced by about 13 million per year. That meant they ran up a deficit because they, they maintained the network without a subsidy. Uh, so to pay for, for the run the deficit, they had to pay for that. So that money came out of their reserves. So if, over four or five years, they have successively made their reserves, and if they then take the hit this year because they, in year monitoring wasn't able to do anything, the reserves at the start of next year will be beneath the level of working capital that they need to run their business. Um, but also, if they start the year and it's not clear that they are in balance, there's a whole range of issues around their judgment of them as a going concern. And whether well, the orders would be on them, 
you could be running into difficulties around the confidence with which suppliers would view them. I mean, we, we basically managed this because of a sufficient reserves. There are not sufficient reserves anymore. There needs to be an additional 20 odd million put into their baseline to re, re, rebase them, boot them, and get them in a proper position, and then they can begin to increase their working capital, perhaps. It, it is the most actual critical issue we're facing. Okay, so with, without that money, there's no, ma there's no mechanism of managing that? There's no mechanism of managing it in the sense that you can't do enough savings to find £20 million without uh, utterly decimating the public transport network. And the public transport network is fundamentally important to the operation of this place, whether uh, school transport, people going to hospitals, people going to work. There's, there, there's no easy solution to this without additional funding being put in, significant additional funding to enable transit to maintain the public transport network. And, and I'm quite sure that you've made finance very aware of this issue um, in your discussions then moving into um, We have over, over successive years um, talked a lot to finance colleagues <coughs> who don't, um, I think, don't disagree with any of the issues and the problem and the nature of it. It gets you down to affordability. <coughs> okay. okay. Mr Hilditch. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Julie, DVA. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it, it surrounds the, the, the licensing aspect of it and people who actually drive for a living uh, who may have become one well at some stage and I suppose spending some time in the constituency office recently. Uh, this has become a, a constant theme. People have been cleared of uh, re well, return to work clearance or by their local GP or indeed the, the local hospital or whatever. <coughs> All the paperwork then goes in to the Coleraine, I believe it is, not that right? Yes. But then there seems to be a three, and in one case, maybe a couple of cases, five month delay on that turnaround. But these people are relying on their licence for their living and their earnings. Is, is that normal, or are we in a situation at the minute where there's a blockage? Or it, they've already been, they've already been cleared at a local level with their medical people? Um, it obviously has to go through um, our processes to confirm and we have occupational health service uh, working alongside us um, to give us that medical advice. So um, that's a process that um, sometimes does take longer and I know causes real difficulties for individuals if that is the case. Um, so various aspects in terms of ensuring all the paperwork's there, in terms of whether there needs to be a second opinion, all of those things need to be worked through. Um, we are looking at how we can speed it up um, and look to see how we can particularly get the medical side of that um, qu more quickly uh, in, which would be the main thing I think that we would need to do to to move and make that service more uh, fleet of foot. Would you, sorry, would you, would you agree that three to five months is quite unacceptable as a yes, I mean, time for uh, I mean, obviously, reminding, you we, know? we need to ensure that people are safe to drive on the road, and, and that needs to be done. Uh, but set, assuming that that is the case, we should be processing those as quickly as we possibly can. By the jewel, if, if, if a local doctor or hospital is given that clearance, is that not already part of the process cleared at that stage? It will depend on the nature of what uh, the illness or the, the difficulty has been, um, and what, I guess, the, the doctor is saying. I know we certainly rely on OHS services to give us further advice, uh, and it also depends on whether uh, the nature of how you want to use your car, whether it's for work or, or just for personal use or whatever. So there's various... People come there's various, us, or, yeah, yeah. Like taxi drivers, lorry drivers, that sort of thing. There's various processes that must be worked through there. But um, equally, could we do it? And are we looking at trying to make that more effective? We are. That's a, a, a separate part of DBA from the MOT centres. You're right, it's based in Coleraine. Yeah. And just on... Uh, the likes of taxis there are just an issue in relation to dealing with a very serious case at the minute, which I can't speak about here, obviously. But illegal taxis, rogue taxi drivers, does the department still, or the agency still carry out uh, investigations or, you know, late evening type investigations on the, on the ground as such? Because obviously there's a growing trend there for some people who may very well look legitimate as a taxi driver, but... Yes, we absolutely. We've got an enforcement arm that goes out. Uh, uh, absolutely, very much so, to uh, protect um, all of us that are using the roads and ensuring that everybody that's there has all the right uh, processes, paperwork, and all in place to uh, demonstrate the legitimacy for the work that they're doing. It's very much part of the business. Okay, thank you. One last one then on 
uh, Casement Park there. Uh, would that be under John Irvine, a major project? I know it's development led, but yourself well, again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a planning application, it's not yeah. a DFI project. Oh. Okay, but obviously the department has to work in conjunction <coughs> and in partnership with planning application and whatnot and stuff. Uh, is all uh, the road sort of works going to be around? Is that all going to be paid for by the developer? Uh, there was so talk of slip roads coming off the so I, M1 I think, and various things. Yeah, I think Andrew and I both talk at this point probably because the bit that I've got is the overseeing and the, the making and the recommendation around the decision. It's a regionally significant project and mm -hmm. therefore my planning uh, service will be looking at that for that. Now, what they then require is obviously all the inputs from all the statutory consultees one significant one of which is roads, so within the same department, and, and that's absolutely one of the issues remaining uh, around Kismet is about resolving roads issues. I don't know whether you want to comment any further on that, Andrew, but uh, certainly on the planning side, we are uh, working as quickly as we can to get the processes in place, but we need the roads issues to be resolved. Uh, and and everybody, of, everybody's yeah. working. Cost then would fall to the developers, aren't they? Yeah. Yes, that is right. It's, it's Conor Lockery is the, one, of, one of his functions is development control, and that means he looks after the statutory uh, consultee role of the department in relation to uh, road safety, road progression, and and parking. So we have actually we have received three different uh, versions of the <coughs> transport assessment from from the Casement Park developers. Uh, each time we have gone back, there have been a number of concerns. Those are progressively being dealt with. I think there were only a fairly small number of concerns in the last one that we sent back. Um, and tried to force extensive issues. I think they are resolved by the developer. But they are at the developer's expense. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beggs. Again, thanks for your, your presentation. The, the Back first to the winter gritting, where you said you, you may not be able to continue to the end of this financial year. Do you have the salt stocks to enable you to do this? Is this purely about having the cash to pay the staff? What, what is the pressure point? It, it's, it's purely about budget, and what we will be doing is preparing a submission to go to the Minister to let her know what the position is. And, okay. and what like my question be. was, do you have the salt stocks? Because that takes time to get there. Uh, if it's we purely have. about uh, paying for the staff, that's a separate we issue. Have plenty of staff, plenty of drivers, and, uh, they, they are in place. All, all of the procedures are in place. The issue with the salt is it only actually hits our budget line whenever it's spread. So whenever we have the salt in the barns, that's, that's materials and, and that's, that's regarded as an asset. It's only when the salt is spread that it hits our budget. Okay. So it's, the, this, the salt is there. Okay, okay. I've got the budget covered spread. Uh, then the, the issue then in terms of your, your um, major capital schemes, the, the balance between huge road schemes, um, minor road improvements, small roundabouts, set of traffic lights to improve road safety, and for that matter, maintenance. Are we out of kilter from all, all other parts? What is our balance presently? What percentage are we spending in each area? Uh, it's really a transport planning issue there. We're, 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 we're not out of kilter. I mean, we, we are progressing flagship schemes at present. The, the, the issue, I suppose, is that flagships, we're spending so much of our limited budget on flagship schemes, not leaving us enough for road maintenance, and it's not leaving us enough for the smaller local transport and safety. Okay. So if we're spending too much on flagship schemes, which, you know, everybody likes cutting the ribbon, this new road scheme comes in, my question is, and you said we're not spending enough on others, what proportion are we spending on the other parts and what proportion would be normal in other regions? Well, it would, it would be normal to be spending well over the £100 million on structural maintenance that we're spending now. We really should be spending the 140. Uh, as far as local transport and safety measures are concerned, we're down to spending a couple of million on that. Yeah. Uh, really, that's an area which does look at bus priority measures, does look at improving walking lengths, does look at cycling. Which I think we should be spending more there. I'm not saying we should be spending less on, look, uh, on, on the strategic road improvement schemes, because we certainly have gaps in the strategic road network, uh, and, and there, are, there are benefits uh, in improving the strategic road network. If we, if we improved, say, if we had a, a bypass of Balna Hinch, 
the town centre of Ballin and Hinch would be a much more livable place to live in, and it would be a safer place, and, and traffic would progress uh, more efficiently as well. So, the, pro the problem for me is that the pot is not big enough to allow me to do the strategic road improvements and the road maintenance and the local transport and safety measures that I would like to do. In, in terms of the contracts, I picked up an earlier comment from you saying that uh, Northern Ireland is more litigious than other parts, and you blame that down to you know, competition <coughs> from uh, local contractors, uh, making it very, very competitive, and then if somebody's presumably unsuccessful looking for reasons to try and get uh, a tender award um, null and void. Would you accept that it's actually our purchasing, purchasing uh, arrangements actually contributes to that as well? I've heard it said that in other parts of the United Kingdom, the legislation has changed. So if, if, there, if someone who objects to a scheme or a, an award is unsuccessful and they've proven perhaps to have uh, not put in a very valid uh, delay or blocking mechanism that they potentially suffer some of the costs associated with delays and that has had a great effect in reducing the number of legal actions which have uh, delayed contracts. Have you, are you aware of that and what action are you taking to ensure that we are updated with our legislation here? Yes, I, I am aware of that. I mean, some, some of our delays have been caused by judicial reviews and, and the threshold for getting a judicial review in Northern Ireland seems to me to be quite bar is quite low and, and the costs are low and that's one of the things the, the Northern Ireland Audit Office did an investigation of major project delivery in Northern Ireland and one of the issues that they want to look at is the, the judicial review process. Okay then moving on in terms of Translink where um, they've operated at a loss the last number of years and their capital reserves have come down. Um, Translink is a limited company, if I understand. It's a public corporation. It's a public corporation, but, but it has uh, responsibilities and its directors will have responsibilities Absolutely. as to how they operate. Absolutely. How are we ensuring that it will be able to continue to function and to provide a service? Well, that's the issue. If we don't get sufficient funding, there can be no guarantee it will be able to continue to provide the public tasks transport network, which is quite expansive here compared to elsewhere in these islands. Um, there's no guarantee we'll be able to continue to do that. But you have made a very good point. The position of directors <coughs> and sales, and I talked earlier, is something we need to be cognizant of and the exposure of people and uh, board members. So that that is mean, a that real risk that, that needs this, to be addressed. Yes, this is a real, this is a red risk. It seems because we're running out of time. We've managed in recent years because of a sufficient cushion from the level of reserves. That isn't there anymore. So if we don't, if, if essentially government doesn't restore the funding needed for the public transport network, it's no expectation that that can continue in such an expansive way. In terms of Northern Ireland Water, then, in terms of its current structure, which uh, has huge pressures as well, uh, it is unable to borrow. Uh, outside of public borrowing requirements. Um, uh, is that issue being actively uh, considered as to what other formats it can uh, move to to enable uh, significant improvements to occur and meet our environmental obligations? We, uh, it's an NDPB at the moment, uh, and you're absolutely right, the borrowing currently it can borrow, but um, it's a bit like what Andrew was describing on the SALT. Uh, in order to spend that money uh, and, and actually put it out there and, and build projects, they require cover from the budget and that's where the constraint um, fits in. So in terms of looking at models, absolutely, we're looking at what um, models uh, and classifications there might be around that uh, in order to look at financial flexibilities. There, there are no easy answers to it um, and it's obviously something we will need to take the views of the, of the Minister on in terms of uh, what those options look like. and. Um, what the best way ahead is. Um, I think everybody accepts that not investing, doing nothing is not an option. We need to do something to actually fund our wastewater infrastructure. The question is, how do we do that and what does that look like? So um, that's something we're looking at. Would you, would you accept, without uh, addressing the problem, the entire Northern Ireland economy is at risk? Because at present, certainly in many parts of my constituency, Larne, many outlying villages, etc., there is no 
current per, uh, planning permissions for should it be new housing developments or should it be actually a potential uh, new employers who require connection <coughs> to, to the sewage system. So the whole economy is slowly uh, uh, slowing down and being inhibited by the failure to take any decision on this area. The, um, it is, uh, there's over 100, uh, around 100 development areas that are constrained at the minute um, and that impact is widespread. Uh, we would view water very much as back to the chair's point about impacting on everybody's <coughs> daily lives. It absolutely does. Uh, and it also impacts on all the various elements of the programme for government, where, whether that be economic, environmental, health, health and well-being. All of it is supported by and needs to have uh, a working and functioning water and wastewater infrastructure service. Understandably, Northern Ireland Water have been funding up to this point their water infrastructure. We need to have, understandably, good quality drinking water. Um, and that has meant that the wastewater side has not had um, adequate investment. Um, and we need to do something about that. But back to, I guess, the global point, as already described, that money currently is financed and has to come out of the block and therefore it competes alongside all the other um, areas that, that we've debated in this room, never mind all the other capital priorities across other departments. Um, so looking at models to identify whether they can get more financial flexibility and therefore able to utilise that borrowing is part of the jigsaw puzzle, but I would say there is no easy answer to that, um, and, what, and that's something we'll need to look at going forward. Okay thank, you. okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, first of all, I declare some interest. I was a former employee of TransLink, um, also a former councillor in Orange and North Down, so it bears in some of these discussions. Also, for Mr. McCartney's benefit, uh, my stepdad is the quality manager of the A6. Very well. Good work. Working hard. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one thing, it was touched upon at the beginning of the committee meeting, but um, the first day brief was really beneficial to have that and gives you a very good overview. But um, if we were to act as an effective scrutiny mechanism in terms of the committee, um, receipt of that at half three yesterday was not acceptable in my opinion. Um, these institutions have been restored and one of the things we have to learn lessons about is about scrutiny and accountability and to have that at half three and only a few hours really to review the document and to be able to have an informed discussion with yourself is something perhaps we can learn lessons from in terms of going forward because I think it's important we have that information uh, to do that. Um, um, just a couple of um, questions. Um, the first one really is in relation to Northern Ireland Water and it's been touched upon and I would agree with the Chair in terms of the fact that infrastructure affects everyone's lives. It gets water and sewage infrastructure is absolutely crucial, um, especially for the economy. And the issues that we're having here in terms of the need for investment have a particular impact in terms of, for example, Mr. Beggs's mentioned planning applications. And if you speak to any councillor across uh, Northern Ireland, you'll see about the issues in terms of uh, applications not being able to be approved. And we really do need to be able to address this. And it's just what the envisaged timescales are in terms of exploring these options. Um, I think the time for continuing to discuss and debate and say how awful it is is gone. I think a time for action is in relation to this because we can't have uh, the people's livelihoods and uh, the economy affected because of the lack of decision making around us. So, is there any time scales in terms of bringing forward options to the minister? Uh, for them? Um, so, in terms of the, this links very much into the budget process and actually into the price control process yeah. that I talked about earlier. Both are linked. Um, so, um, <coughs> price control process whereby the regulator will look at what is needed over the next six years and will give us a really good assessment of the capital requirements of Northern Ireland Water independently assessed I think is a is a huge benefit to the department because you've got that external scrutiny on that and, and uh, um, that means we've got a, a firm a firm grip on, on what we actually require. That then needs to be uh, considered alongside the budget processes and, and time frames and whatever on that and obviously um, the desire of the executive to get to multi-year budgets which would really, really help in terms of, of giving some degree of clarity uh, moving ahead and I know Northern Water would, would very much welcome that. Um, so that's part of it too. Uh, then you're into, well okay, then what about the options? Um, to do anything, um, I guess, fundamental in there will take time. It's likely to require legislation. Um, so in, in our view at the moment, it's likely that we need some element of cap additional capital uh, 
Then you get into, obviously, water was mentioned in the New Decade New, new Approach document and, and um, you know, specified as, as one of the areas to be looked at and will need to be considered alongside those priorities. So it's part of that conversation too. Um, and then figuring out well, what do the options look like. The short answer to your question is we will, we will be looking at options very quickly, uh, but obviously that's something that we want to take the mind of, of the Minister on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just to, just to make the point, Chair, as Julie said, if it has to be funded by the taxpayer, you're talking large sums of money. If you look at the, the document, talks about A5 and A6. A5 alone would be about a billion pounds to do with the period. And we could settle further funding for the A6 before you get to the water. I mean, these are big numbers, so if it remains that they have to be funded from taxpayers' money, the numbers are bigger almost than the Northern Iron Block at the minute. Just in relation so it's not just a matter of will, it's a matter of securing funding. Just in relation to the A5, are you in a position to give us an update as to where that project actually sits? Obviously it's going, there's a public inquiry due. Yes. For a second. The, well, that, that is the stage we're at, that's, that's the public inquiry. Uh, that, that, if the public inquiry runs its course, uh, I think we could without, if there is no further legal challenge, we could be starting construction late this year or early next year. Uh, yes, that's, that's, that's the first part, that's, that's, that's phase 1A of the, of the A5. It's the, it's the flagship. The flagship now is no longer the full project. We're taking through the statutory processes for the full A5 project, mm. uh, but this is a, a fairly limited public inquiry. On the to the environmental statement. Uh, and have you overcome the issues, obviously, that led to the legal challenge towards the end of um, sep uh, we 2017? We believe we have. Yes. So it's not a state. It's not a. It's not. We're not in the position. Where we're going to have to go back to scratch, essentially, on this. No, we. Uh, as, as this, I mean, this is not a procurement issue because we have a contractor in place. Although we still have certain things to do with that contractor, so before we can start this next phase. Uh, this is in, it comes from the anti A5 alliance, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a high likelihood that there will be another one of those challenges, probably after the public inquiry. Yes, we really just have to watch the space. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Muir. Yeah, thank you. Um, to just over a couple of other issues. Just in page 31, uh, different page numbers, but I think it's page 31. Uh, referred to the review of the Planning Act in 2011, and this relates to another issue in terms of how the infrastructure affects the livelihoods and businesses and the economy of people, and planning has a major impact in relation to that. And if there will be any view in terms of time scales for bringing forward that review of the planning act? Um, that's obviously something we need to talk to the minister yeah. about. It's, it's on the list of things to be discussed with her. Um, so um, I'm, I think that's something really, to be honest, that's in okay. terms of time frames, we need to figure out where that sits alongside other things that she wants to do. So yeah. it's appropriate to leave that yeah. for now, if that's no problem. The other one was in terms of EU exit, and it was referred to the fact mm -hmm. that the department is quite Brexit heavy in relation to that. And there's been referenced in terms of work has to be done at ports and stuff like that. Just to know how advanced that is and uh, whether the ability to plan and, and do stuff is curtailed by the sort of uncertainty in terms of what will happen after the implementation period. Um, well, Brexit was quite intense, sort of, but obviously for most of last year a lot of the work was around contingency planning for no deal. So that was looking at uh, things like the enterprise, how we could ensure that's still run with no deal. Um, <clears throat> in a sense now that there's a deal, uh, it's almost reversed, and then saying, well, what are the consequences of that? So there will be some work going on. That's been around the ports in terms of what, well, when it's clear what these letters mean or doesn't mean, and what checks there might be, there's a look at what will there mean to be facilities provided in some of the ports for checking by different agencies. But that is at a very early stage now, because clearly it is not clear, but except there will be checks, particularly east west. West East. Um, so there's a lot of contingency planning going on. It's obviously had to change direction in the last couple of months, but there's still uncertainty. A lot of colleagues are heavily engaged in this, um, and we need to do work. On, we work closely with our ports colleagues. We work closely with colleagues across the water. It's but it's still pretty uncertain at the minute. 
So that will also affect the budget position for next year as well in terms of having to have necessary funds. To <coughs> well, this year, in, in the current year, we were lucky enough to be able to avail of some Brexit-linked funds, particularly a significant amount of capital where we got almost half the money and we were able to do sort of like road improvements, the airports and stuff like that and do some good work. Um, the minute we can't size what would need to be done in the ports, it doesn't necessarily clear that it would be our spend as opposed to port spend, perhaps maybe dearer spend. It depends on the nature of the chip I mean, who has to provide that. But that's not clear at the moment at all. Okay. Just one last question. Uh, page 35 referred to the whole issue of reservoirs and it referred to sort of some which were in uh, a fair state of repair. I just want to have an understanding of the level of risk that's associated with that because if, God forbid, you know, one of these reservoirs failed, you know, the, the potential loss of life would be quite significant. So just an understanding of the level of risk that we're sitting with at the present moment in time. Well, that's exactly what we want to understand yeah. as well. Yeah. And we have a we have recruited uh, an, an, an all or appointed an all panel reservoirs engineer to look at those, and, and that's exactly the question. Uh, we're just starting to get those reports. <coughs> now, to get but that. something in poor condition doesn't mean to say there's risk of catastrophic failure. Yeah. It might just be that it leaks slightly, and, and that's you know not a particular risk to anybody. Uh, but that's what we want to try and find out now. Okay. So at this stage, no audit has been completed in relation to <coughs> reservoirs. No, we haven't. We haven't got the full picture. Uh, and this is not a new risk for Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has no, never I had the full that. picture before. We have a considerably better picture now than we had before. And when do you envisage having um, a, a fuller picture? I'll be talking from memory now, but we're within a few months of that. Okay. Thank you. Mr McCartney. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry I had to leave. So if I ask a question, I apologies in advance. Uh, it, it's just in relation to, and um, it was touched on about day five and uh, the, the judicial review, and that <clears throat> was standing people's right day, no legal challenge and the cost, etc. Uh, in the aftermath of that, w w was there a, an analysis done then by the department how that perhaps could have been avoided? Yes, um, as, as often happens in legal challenges in Northern Ireland, the area where the court found against the department mm. is, is a first. It's the first time it ever happened. Uh, and, and the A5 was the first time that particular thing had ever happened. We have closed that gap. We have also looked at the... I mean, the, when, when the initial challenge happened in the A5, there was a large number, 12 or 13 maybe, grounds of challenge. Uh, we assessed our vulnerability on all of those. We only lost on one of them. Yeah. But there was a certain degree of vulnerability with, with others as well, which we didn't lose on. And we've actually been closing that vulnerability down too. So every time we have had yeah. a challenge or a threat of a challenge, we have assessed the vulnerability. And if we have assessed that there was a vulnerability, we have closed that down. Yeah. So, I mean, that environmental statement wouldn't happen in a future project of this size, or I suppose no. it's hard to say it couldn't, but you know, no, you know the gap. You know the gap. We have, yeah. de we have delivered schemes since that with yeah. those lessons learned and yeah. those schemes got yeah. through and were challenged. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and without no retrospective, there may have been schemes in the past get through. If it had been challenged on them grounds, they might not get through. Uh oh, well, yeah. certainly throughout yeah. the country yeah. there were schemes that went through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's that sort of danger sometimes. It happens, you know, you go on, you go on, on one grounds, but an hour ground is, is found, and it's just something we have to try and look at going forward. In terms of the A6, and we've talked about it, uh, has there been any scoping exercise done? Because it's very, very obvious when you do the two bits that are now uh, being completed, then the, 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 the middle bit will become the, the focus of people saying, are we ready to lay down what's necessary for that? It will be. I, I, th I think we have already opened the, the most urgently needed part yeah, of yeah, the A6. Yeah. Uh, that's probably my favourite piece of road improvement yeah. uh, that, that we have delivered. It, it, it was an embarrassment, that, that section of road, that it was a single carriageway and it was, mm. it was a very congested part of the network and it's now been sorted out. Uh, the, the other parts will, will make big improvements as well. Um, I, I would be hopeful that when when those two contracts are, are completed, that there will not be congestion at, at any of the other parts. But, but you're quite right, it, yeah. will, it will still be something that our transport plans will need to look at. As someone once said, no regrets that we don't see the money like primary school every morning. I'm sure they're not regret not seeing the traffic every morning. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and I do apologise. I missed the, the start of the briefing. Um, 
but I just want to pick up on, on that DVA. Uh, the NAW issue because I mean I remember being back on the, the DRB committee originally they were up to PC21 um, just they're on page 59 and just uh, you may have clarified some of this I mean it's, it's talking about um, in this to 100 such areas with the four there's 37 areas under stress just in terms of the whole network in terms of the maintenance the ongoing works and the projected capital works which obviously will come on the PC yep. <clears throat> Where are we at in, in percentage terms and all of that? Okay, so in terms of, of, of what's needed, um, there's, there's several, I think, layers to that. So we currently provide uh, Northern Water of about 300 million, just over 300 million directly from the department as government funding. Um, in terms of what they need, uh, and that's a combination of capital and revenue, in terms of um, what they assess they require, uh, the number depends on whether you've got inflation in it and, and what exactly is included, but for the PC21 period, all inclusive, including inflation, including other elements of the Living with Water programme, is 2.5 billion that is needed. Now, that is in comparison to the PC15 period, which was at uh, 990, so we are consider it as John has already indicated as well we would be considerably short from if we just continue to fund them at their current rate we need to find a different solution to get them more money um, and there are really only kind of two ways of doing it you either increase the funding that comes from the public purse uh, which is you know the capital funding and, and all of that and the normal budgetary processes or you look to identify is there another way of doing it whether it be from borrowing or other revenue streams uh, now all of that is a very difficult area um, and minister and other executive colleagues have made their their positions very very clear about about water <coughs> charges um, on all I will say is in terms of increasing flexibility and in terms of uh, moving effectively to a place where Northern Water can do more themselves, can borrow themselves, can utilise money themselves, the more you want to do that, the more you need to push them as a company further and further away from government control. Those two things go yeah. hand in hand. No, no and I pre know. appreciate that, but what I'm trying to delve in there, because I'm listening to Ray talk about housing develops not be able to be met. Um, you talked that you have an oversight into the area plant, which is coming now soon. Those areas that were zoned zone for development, well, yeah. sustainability, and all of that. But you, the the buzzwords around all the documents. But my point is, I, I would not like to think that over the last ten years in infrastructure projects, we built pro we built infrastructure that cannot facilitate. Do you understand me? In some of those towns, I know Belfast got a big. A load of money in, in relation to what it needed to do, that's grand. But I mean, I know that some areas have built sewage treatment centres, brand, spine, brand new ones, and I would say they're built to last for 25 or 30 years with a projection of the developments of those individual areas. That's the point I'm making, yeah. it, and I take it we haven't done that. Um, there's uh, Northern Ireland Water will have done a, a lot of modelling work <coughs> around each of those wastewater treatment uh, centres and what uh, works and what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, the Belfast one in particular, which is part of the Living with Water programme and a significant part of it, uh, so that, that current facility is working at well over capacity. Now, that means they look at connections and look at applications on an ongoing basis, and I'm sure you are picking up that as right across Northern Ireland, but the Belfast example is maybe a good one. Um, they need to um, significantly expand that wastewater treatment works. Uh, and that's a significant, obviously, requirement on, and would be expected to be funded and will come through, I'm pretty sure, as one of the requirements within PC21. Um, now, you multiply that then across the rest of Northern Ireland, and there's multiple towns which have the same issue to a much smaller scale. Um, what will happen and what will be set out literally in their business plan in, in a matter of days is the programmes that need to be done. Um, so all the supporting work, is, is, you're right, I mean, that what... You can say the numbers, but below that, there is a ton of work that has been done by Northern Ireland Water about exactly what is needed. Were, it, were to model uh, the requirements to understand that, uh, and they are feeding into the local development planning process, so there is a connection there. Um, but that will then all go to the regulator, who will then take a view on whether that is 
um, yes, is that the right thing to do? Is that the right profile for it? Is that the right cost for it? And we'll get an independent assessment around it. So there's a lot of work has been done led by Northern Ireland Water. They've also gone around councils, and I'm sure you've probably picked up a lot of that too. Uh, whereby they've been going around and informing local councils about what it means, partly so that they know themselves and that they get that information, but also to help inform the local development plan process. So that though there, but there's a there's an awful lot of work to establish what the capacity needs of each of those uh, treatments absolutely. are. Absolutely, and, and you should know. be part of the bigger program yeah. in terms of the area development because the new infrastructure projects should be built for adaptation as well yeah. in the future. Yeah. That's. That's fine to me. Just I want to come on to the roads, Andrew, because I mean, a number of years ago in the old DRD, we done a report into the, the actual structure of the road to me. There, there was a number of years, one in 25 and one in 50, and all of that there. Um, you're saying to me, we've got 100 million at the minute, and it's taken 140 or two, right? I know some of the roads in, in my own constituency, I'm not naming them to you today. The, um, where are we at in, in terms of the overall? Uh, structure of the roads, the, the that, majority of that, the rural roads now. That, that plan you were talking to is actually the structural maintenance funding plan. Mm -hmm. The structural maintenance funding plan looks at the different categories of road that we have and says how often they should be either resurfaced or, yeah. or given surface, uh, uh, surface dressing. Um, we're, we're nowhere near the frequencies that, that we should be. Um, every year we do work out and I'm not sure what the figure will be for this year, but on rural roads, it may well be that they're only getting a resurfacing every hundred years, instead of every. Uh, they should they should probably be surfaced dressed twice, and then resurfaced after that. So they should probably get it every forty years. What what's happening as of budget restrictions is that, that we're not able to do that. We're surface dressing them, uh, to crack cover the cracks basically. We're we're patching them uh, within our reduced service. But the, the resilience of the road network is reducing because we're doing that. When you get layers and layers of surface dressing, and then you get a hot summer, the, the, you know, the, the road loses its shape. No, no, I appreciate that. And I mean, I was. Um, I, I actually thought the monitoring, because we know in particular roads infrastructure, no matter what it is, and the monitoring towards the end of the financial year, there's shovel ready projects for, that can be done in small amounts. I mean, I would have thought we, we, we could have got a few pounds out. Maybe we just didn't sell it well enough, or the minister didn't like us on the day. What? I mean, well, well just to be clear, first of all, the bids for January balloting were lodged in December, so they predate the turn of the executive. So we had a lot of ourselves. We bid. I mean, we would have bid for more stuff to means if we thought we could have got it spent. Yeah. I mean, if you only if you only no bid end of January, there's a limit yeah. to what you get spent. So we always bid for what we think we can spend. In this case, if we think we could. We could have spent much more. No, and there, there's, an, there's an issue actually there that you've, you've probably highlighted. We, we are a much smaller organisation than we were five years ago. Um, within Roads and Rivers uh, and the roads part, which you're, you're interested in, we actually had a, a, a programme of reducing our size because our budgets were short and we tried to put more money into the frontline services and we actually cut our staff by 10%. And immediately on completion of that, there was a voluntary exit scheme that the executive agreed, which cut us by a further 15%. So we have lost 25% of our We're much smaller. Roads and Rivers now is a lot smaller than the Roads organisation was five or six years ago. Uh, one of the implications of that is that we no longer have the capacity to put large numbers of people out supervising contractors and, and in fact, having schemes ready towards the end of the year. So. Whilst I, I remember at one time in the past we spent £40 million pounds after Christmas, we, we can't spend anything near that amount now. Right, and, and just following off on that, and I appreciate that because most of us, like I, I certainly do get 50% of the issues raised are definitely for roads issues for me. Um, is, is there a directive now, um, some of the councillors have contacted me in relation to, is there a directive now that councillors who asked for a site meeting with the local road? Roads manager, whatever. Has that to go to the minister now? Is that a directive? No. Uh, there, there was a period that the minister was obviously keen to know what meetings were happening, and we had to feed that up the line. So that, that, that did happen for a short period. No, the minister has, has now accepted that meetings with councillors are, are a normal part of our, our routine business. Uh, we, we would simply feed a report back after those meetings take place. OK, and just two quick questions, Chair of May. The North West and East Link Roads in Armagh. 
any updates. I know it's not on the on the program, and, and the um, these are projects that have been about for a long number of years. I mean, I, anybody who travels from the south end of the city and the west end of the city, it, it's a major, major issue. I mean, I, I cut, cut away across country to avoid our mass city in the mornings. Is there, is there any updates in relation to any of that? No, those are roads that have been sitting dormant. For a certain amount of development has been undertaken. Uh, further development will, will depend on, first of all, our own transport planning process, and then what the minister. Does. Okay, I'll, I'll keep at that. And just finally, the interconnectors mentioned in the. Mm-hmm. Who would like to respond then? Um, Me. Okay, yeah. I mean, it's, it's. Have we got the money for underground yet? No. No, I, I can only respond about the, the planning application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, where we're at in that is, is nearly there, I suppose, is the, the way to describe it. Um, just finalising all the elements of that particular application and would hope to be making a recommendation to Minister in the not too distant future. Um, we don't fund it directly, so that's about it. It's okay. I'm a, just saying the I, planning I, application. I, I appreciate the yeah. you don't fund it. The, the issue is clearly. The application is in for overhead and only anyway. That's, there's, there's a decision going to the minister. Yeah, okay. 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 Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, Jim Buchanan. Yep, thank you. I'll not be, uh, well, should I say, I'll be briefer. A uh, couple of points just on the A6 and A31. Good job, and I appreciate Andrew's uh, input. I've had numerous farmers, not going to into the detail, our landowners. Back four or five years ago, they expected they were getting A, B, and C. Okay, and landowners and farmers are very much farming community. They don't get the detail, but now they're sort of getting the pain of no. Like we didn't agree to that. We agreed to this. I, you were told me this. You were told me that. It's maybe not a question. It's more a, a future new road bill that the farmer or the landowner is clear exactly what he or she is getting. Not financially, because I appreciate that's a process, but boundary lines, detail of hedgerows. I'm dealing with numerous of those purely A6 and A31s. And A31 Macfell bypass is open probably what. Three years ish. So it's just a point, Andrew, maybe not so more yeah. as, a, as a question, but it's how you make that process smoother and cleaner. Yes, I mean, we, we have a lot of land staff that, that work on that, our contractor works on that as well, but you're quite right until people actually see things on the ground. Maybe there's something that they agreed to in the past that it's not that they wouldn't have agreed to it if they'd known what it was like. There's actually a long tail of activity. Uh, that, that follows a, a major road scheme being delivered on the ground. So you, you've seen the first bit of the A6 has mm-hmm. now been opened, and it looks as though that's it finished. But but it's not. I can assure you that there are staff still working with landowners on that scheme, and and probably will be for several years down the line. Okay. The monitoring around the, co- the lighting point we discussed yesterday was lighting and columns. Is any of that money going to be used for a pair of lights, or just new columns and lights? There's, there's two. Serious issues with our well, there's probably three <laughs> issues with street lighting. One is that we still have a large stock using non-LED mm. lanterns, and, and we want to get LED lanterns in there as quickly as possible to reduce our electricity bills. They would sort of save us about half of the electricity bill. Uh, the second thing is that we have a large number of outages at present, and it's growing by about six, seven hundred per week uh, because we're not keeping track with the the ones that go out. Um, we, we need funding. To to fix those. I'm not sure actually what came through in the monitoring. I'm not sure there was anything for that. Um, it's a replacement of columns. Just columns and lights. Mm-hmm. Preferred mm-hmm. Right. The, the, the third area of street lighting that's giving me concern is that we have 280,000 odd street lighting columns. They have a certain life, and at the end of that certain life, they have to be replaced. Now, the design life is about 25 years. They sometimes last for 30 to 40 years, but once they get beyond that sort of lifespan, they, they can fail without without notice. They, they, they generally corrode below the surface, so you can look at it, it looks fine, the next thing you know it's fallen down. We've had large numbers of them falling down, and we have, uh, I think, 40,000 of them that are that are at that stage where they're, they're beyond their design life, beyond their usable life, and we ought to be spending about £12 million pounds a year, sorry, 13 or £14 million pounds a year, I think it is now. Uh, and just replacing the, the, the ones that are coming up to that stage. Um, we're not doing that at all. We spent nothing this year. Have you experienced any outages in LED yet? I know they're a new phenomena, but have you experienced any outages in them? And what's the time span on an, on, on an LED outage? You know, we're looking at 15 years. What's, you know, the... you, I think they say 10 to 12 years uh, for an LED as opposed to 3 to 4 years for a, a conventional lantern. 
Uh, we did have some outages with the initial pilot, uh, but they were just fixed under guarantee. OK, and then back to you, Julie. Topic of today. Is this a good opportunity in the whole MOT pipe now? Because on page 33, MOT waiting times, that was all last year. Is this a good opportunity now to do a written branch review of the entire MOT system, we'll call it? And I know we're talking about lifts, but I'm talking about you know, waiting times, etc. Because et we've only got seven days in the week. We can't ultimately do any more than that. And yes, we've got 24 hours in a day, but that's all a problem, you know? Well, it's back to, I think, some of the issues we were debating earlier around whatever model and how we um, come to the solutions around the lifts. Then back to the points raised earlier, we need to understand how our capacity and demand can be managed. And as I said earlier, the work that we did over the summer actually puts us in better place to understand some of those dynamics, um, and we will be working to do that. Um, because whatever solution it is, it has to actually work for the capacity that we've uh, that we've got and the demand of people that will will be bringing their cars to us. So we need to absolutely understand how those two connect. Okay. Just picking up, picking up on the previous point, so are you saying then, uh, I'll you answer it, regarding if I wanted to meet an engineer, let's say a Cookstown or Mockerfeld engineer regarding a road, does that engineer, can that engineer meet me without authorisation from HQ? No, if it was a local issue, we would, we would normally check that in advance with the minister just to make sure she was content. But we do that, we don't do it on an individual basis, we do it on a sort of a schedule for the week. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm very mindful of the time and obviously the length of time that you've been here uh, as well, uh, which we very much appreciate. Um, there are a number of questions on lots of areas that probably we could require much greater scrutiny um, and um, no doubt you'll be regular visitors to the committee in the coming weeks and months. So we look forward to that. Um, so can I thank you very much for, for your time again today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving then on to item eight, which is our draft forward work programme. Just um, draw your attention to the proposed programme, which is on page 1190. So hopefully that will be the last of the large packs as well. Um, <laughs> Just read that out again. To <laughs> page 1190. Um, we have the minister coming up to, to brief us next week. We also plan to have, um, still to be confirmed, we plan to have Paul Duffy from DVA, and we'll also explore the opportunity of getting a briefing in relation to the SR, which we referred to in the earlier part of the um, meeting. Um, if you're content, um, what, we, what we will do, the committee staff will then look to populate the forward work programme with NDPBs and various other um, areas of work um, which have obviously been highlighted um, through today's discussion and at some stage we will also be having our own um, away day in order to discuss sort of our strategic work programme um, as, as we move forward. So if you're content to, to agree that, um, we can then move on. Um, any other business? Members of any other business that you'd like to raise at this stage? Okay, no, thank you. Move then to our next meeting, which will be at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 5th of February, in the Senate Chamber. And if the members are content, we shall adjourn. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.